Hi, Zen. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hello, it's great to be here with you, Tajan. Likewise, I've been looking forward to this since we planned this just a few days ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hmm. We've been developing a really sweet friendship. Feels like the beginning of a really nice friendship over the past months. And um, so, ah, it's time to share Zen with the world. So that's what we're doing today. Um, <laughs> and I'd love to start with the usual question, which is about a life story. And, um, you know, one of the projects I want to work on this year is writing a memoir or like some mm. kind of autobiographical piece. And I'm still chewing on what that looks like. But um, mm. that project has me thinking even more about this question of like, what is one's life story and how to represent it? And um, for me, it's really almost an art form to answer this question, to be asked it and to answer mm. it and not to add pressure, but it's just like, whatever mm. you say, even if it's one word or a gesture, it's like, it is an expression of who you are and your life and the universe. And to me, that's, that's sacred. Like you are mm -hmm. this beautiful, beautiful being <laughs> just like everyone else on the one hand, but also like mm -hmm. no one else on the other hand. <laughs> yep. And so to hear you share what you'd like to share is um, to have that opportunity feels like this is a precious temple of worship where we get to mm, worship mm. together. And uh, mm. so with that context, whatever you'd like to share about <laughs> your life, I would love to hear. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I need to start before the beginning in some ways. Uh, I've come to believe that understanding our family backgrounds and family histories feels deeply important to understanding like the way that we got where we are. Um, so I'll just share that, um, on my mom's side of the family, my grandparents, uh, were born and lived in Taiwan and my grandfather grew up during the Jap Japanese occupation and was drafted by the Japanese army. Um, well, this is like a pretty upsetting thing for a lot of Chinese people to be drafted by an occupying army. And then, um, basically be asked to go fight in China against people who are like of their own culture. Um, and while my grandfather was in Hong Kong, uh, he managed to escape from the Japanese military base that he was stationed at. Um, I believe the story goes that he hid inside of a room closet and everyone thought that he was off of the base. So they went out of the base to look for him. And then while they were gone, he snuck out of the base. Um, but he had the good fortune of being taken in by a local family. So they kind of hid him from the army while they were searching for him. And he was really touched by this. He was asking them like, you know, how come you're risking your own lives to take me in and protect me? And they explained to him that they were Christians, um, and that they were doing this because it's kind of like what their religion taught to do. Um, and he was so moved by this that, that he converted to Christianity. Um, he became a Lutheran. Um, and when he returned to Taiwan, um, I think he was very energized by his faith because uh, he did a number of unusual things. Uh, he started a blanket factory that employed the indigenous people on the island. Um, there are very few jobs for indigenous people at the time. And at the time, the word culture was also that people worked seven days a week and he would give people Sundays off um, in honor of his religion. Uh, and that was seen as like a very progressive thing to do. Uh, <laughs> and I actually became um, quite successful um, running this business, working with indigenous people. And at a certain point, his brothers actually became very jealous of him and um, started writing bad checks in his name. And uh, at the time under um, the KMT's military rule in Taiwan, the laws against um, being a debtor were very strict. So um, as soon as bad check, the check started to bounce basically, he was sent to debtor's prison and um, 
So my mom actually grew up, she was the youngest of six siblings during the time when uh, her dad was in prison. And that was like a very difficult time for her family financially. Um, but remarkably, uh, she was one of those people who kind of like knew from a very young age uh, what she always wanted to do, which was to play piano. Um, and for like a poor family and like a impoverished country, that I feel like that's such an insane dream to have in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> but her family really supported her, really like found um, like friends of friends who own pianos and she would visit their homes and like practice and um, her brothers really banded together to um, pay for her tuition to private schools that had music programs. Um, and so she was able to grow up playing this instrument that she loved, um, the great sacrifice of all her older siblings. Um, and yeah, she grew up in the context of this church that her father had founded. Um, and Christians are a very small minority in Taiwan, maybe like 1% of the population. Um, it's really quite rare to meet Taiwanese Christians. Um, and then we we'll kind of like switch over to my dad's side of the family for a while. Um, my dad is the oldest of four siblings and uh, he comes from like German stock on his mother's side, Norwegian and Irish stock on his dad's side. And Growing up, he was one of these like really bright, precocious kids who hated school because it felt like such a confinement to him. Um, really like one of the sci-fi outcasts. Um, just had a really difficult time in high school. Um, and while he was going through that, his parents also had quite an acrimonious divorce um, to the point where they weren't sharing financials with each other uh, because they were like embroiled in these lawsuits. And one of the results of they're not sharing financials is that uh, my dad was not able to apply for um, federal financial aid, go to school and things like that. So I think he's probably one of the few baby boomers that I know who like actually had to pay his own way through school because um, I feel like FAFSA was quite good back then. Um, and as a result of his parents divorcing, I think he developed a lot of religiosity. Um, he felt like his parents could have maybe saved their marriage if um, they were more kind of like grounded in their religion. And I think he also had a moment of religious experience um, in kind of maps that I have now. Maybe he had some kind of arising and passing ex away experience, but um he got this real like fire in him um, to spread the gospel um, and he became very evangelical. And the way he reacted to that was he started thinking to himself like, okay, well, well I have to save the most souls possible. And then he was looking at like, okay, where are the countries where there are like least Christians, uh, like the biggest population. And he was looking at China and it's like, wow, yeah, there's very, very little missionary activity going on in China. I better learn Mandarin and I better go to China and become a missionary. So he puts himself through school, like working all these uh, like kitchen jobs. And it takes him five years to graduate. So he has to take an entire year off to work, um, does all this stuff. But he comes out, he's great at speaking Mandarin, um, he's really dedicated. And he just picks himself up and goes to Asia and he's like trying to get into China. Um, and he realizes that it's very dangerous to be a missionary in China. Um, like if you were to try to bring a Bible into the country at the time, um, they definitely would have turned you away. Um, and so he ends up in Taiwan as kind of like a stepping stone um, towards going to China. And he starts to make these local connections and he meets Pastor Chen, who is um, running this small Lutheran church, which he thinks is so funny because he grew up Lutheran and like here he is in Taiwan meeting these other Lutherans. Um, so it feels like a very small world. And through Pastor Chen, he meets uh, my mom and they kind of like have this 
really intense romance and get married after like a year after they met each other basically um which i think is what happens when you're practicing abstinence it's like <laughs> uh probably accelerates things a lot um and as a result of their meeting uh, my dad's priorities kind of shift um you can probably relate to that uh, a little bit <laughs> Um, so my dad decides that in order to help my mom live out her dreams, um, he's going to bring her back to the U.S. where she could go to university and study piano performance. Um, and so he comes to the U.S. and he's trying to figure out a way where he can support himself and support her. And so he wants to like find a kind of like well-paying career. Uh, so he takes on a lot of debt to go to law school um, and he graduates literally number one in this class. Um, it's just like insane levels of motivation. Um, then he finds out that he really hates practicing law or that he doesn't really like mesh at all with the culture in law firms and he feels like the incentives are really misaligned. Um, he's not able to do the work that he wants to do with the law that'll actually like make a positive change in the world. Um, and meanwhile, my mom has um, gotten an undergraduate degree. Um, she's been learning piano this whole time. Um, and my dad at some point um, starts working for the US State Department as a translator. So he's uh, giving tours all around the country to uh, PRC officials. Um, traveling a lot and I I believe it was during this time um, that my mom had an affair this isn't something that I found out until uh, I was like 18 or so but it really goes on to like color much of my childhood um, and the rest of my life really um, as a result of the affair my dad feels like he can no longer do this kind of work where he's traveling all the time. Like he needs to be at home and like uh, really foster the relationship. Um, and it also just causes a lot of strife. Um, I think my uh, my dad holds a lot of like anger towards my mom at that time for what had happened. Um, he felt like he sacrificed so much, like he kind of gave up some of his really important dreams for her. And this is kind of like what happened. Um, and in the background of all of that, uh, I was born, and I do think a big backdrop of my life is kind of like my dad wasn't necessarily sure about my paternity at the time, but he also didn't want to be sure. So I don't think he ever like got a paternity test. Um, and I th think because of his Christian background, uh, he had this kind of attitude towards me. Uh, and I think that my name on some level is like a cryptographic um, embodiment of this concept he had so my kind of like heretical take on Christianity is Mary might have been raped and Joseph was this like very um, loving man who took her in anyway and like raised the son as his own and that's how we get Jesus who's this like beautiful figure and I think my dad understood kind of like that essence of that story also so he was like well how can I be like Joseph here I'm gonna love this son as my own like regardless of whether he is my own son in some sense. Um, so he named me Matthew, which means like gift of God, which is like, it's kind of like whether or not I'm genetically his son, I'm still from God. Um, <laughs> so I think there's a lot of like noble motivations my dad had. At the same time, I think underneath there were these kind of like unconscious motivations too. Um, and I think that one dynamic that really emerged in my like early childhood relationship with him is that he kind of had the story in his mind that if I was very intelligent, if I was giving a lot of signs of intelligence, that I was kind of like his son. Um, and so he was always kind of like looking for ways in which I was intelligent. And, and I was always jumping through these hoops to kind of like prove how smart I was and like kind of like earn his love. Um, and I think one of the like unconscious deals or maybe it was even spoken that my parents made after the affair was that 
my dad was basically like, why don't like you go out and do the work and I'm going to stay home and I'm going to take care of the kids. Um, so my mom kind of became the sole breadwinner of the family um, and she was working as a piano teacher. Um, so sometimes I would go with her to lessons and I would kind of like, I was a very obedient child. So I would just kind of like sit quietly and she would like lavish these other kids with her attention. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's definitely some like um, mother-son dynamics that we'll get into later. Um, and meanwhile, my dad was very depressed. Um, so I rem some of my earliest memories from when I was like three or four involved like comforting my dad while he was crying. And um, he got really mad at me once because he had like a lot of medications he was taking. And once I like, I basically sorted his pill box. Um, so I put all the like pills with the like pills um, when he had them organized by day of like all the pills he needed to take each day. Uh, and he got upset at me for that. Um, so just like taking care of someone with kind of like volatile mental health was like a big part of my childhood. Um, and it definitely like parentified me really early. I think, I think there was a way in which as a child, I felt like I was already very responsible for managing my parents' emotions and kind of like stabilizing their relationship too. Um, so I remember they would fight sometimes and, um, I don't think my dad ever hit my mom that I can remember, but he would sometimes like throw things, um, and they would break and it was like, a, yeah, like physically intimidating, maybe dangerous environments at times. And as a child, I would like physically insert myself in, into the midst of their argument, basically to kind of be like, Hey, like calm down. I'm here. Like, um, and that later developed into the superiority complex I had where um, I was very unable to like feel or process anger. It was something that I would always like hold deep down inside myself. Um, and I would feel superior to my father where he would be really angry. And I would kind of be like, look, I'm just a small child and I'm like not able to express anger. Um, so like, what's wrong with you? Um, <laughs> um so there's all of that. And then my uh, my first brother, Mark, was born and I was so elated. I had been like really begging my parents to have another kid. So I would have like my best friend, basically. Um, and um, we have such a wonderful relationship. Um, and then right after my brother, Mark, was born, uh, my dad thought that uh, maybe he was ready to give being a missionary another opportunity. Um, so our family moved to move back to Taiwan. Um, at the time, um, my grandfather was considering retiring from being the pastor for church. And my dad saw an opportunity to, that maybe he could take over as the pastor um, and kind of like have a stable life that way. Um, so we moved into this apartment uh, in the building where my grandparents lived. And that building also contained our church. Um, in Taiwan, there's kind of this fascinating thing where a lot of families will slowly like take over sections of, a, of an apartment building and you can almost have like an entire floor that's just like people of one family who live there together. Um, it's quite cool. <laughs> um, so I moved to that environment. Um, I'd grown up speaking Mandarin with my mom, so I was able to like communicate with people in that way, but I did find the culture um, transition quite shocking in a lot of ways like uh going from minnesota which has a lot of like open space and room to this very dense urban environment in taipei um and just all these new cultural customs and new family dynamics um and it was around that time that i discovered this deep love i have for mathematics because it was one thing that stayed a constant wherever i was i was like oh, like numbers and math, like no matter where I go in the world, that seems to be the same. Um, so that really fascinated me. Um, and we were in Taiwan for about two to three years, um, during which time my brother Luke was born. 
And I have a lot of fond memories from Taiwan. I was very like zealous at the time. I basically took it as my mission as like a little missionary to talk to all the Taiwanese kids and try to like convince them of Jesus's love and like uh, how great it was to be a Christian and all of these things. Um, so I was always trying to make friends in order to like spread the good word. Um, <laughs> it was quite a happy childhood in a way. Um, and I had like my cousins um, who were really awesome and took good care of me. Um, lived through like a really big earthquake there. Um, which is, I mostly think of that as like an exciting time. Um, and during the time in Taiwan, uh, my parents started noticing this affinity I had for math and really like nurturing it. So uh, my mom would play these games with me. Like um, she would be like, okay, these two numbers multiply to 42 and they add to 13. And then I would be like, oh, it's six and seven. And um, yeah, this is a game she would play with me when I was like five or six. And I didn't realize till many years later that I was basically learning to factorize quadratic equations um, <laughs> by playing that game. Um, so when I came back to the US, um, my family was in pretty bad financial shape because they hadn't really been making money in Taiwan and they were trying to secure different mission grants, um, but those kept falling through. And my dad had this big credit line um, because he was a barred attorney and um, through the bar association, you can get these like credit cards with like really insane credit limits. Um, so he basically was like leaning on credit cards to kind of like keep the family afloat. Um, and he invested a lot of money into my education specifically. And I think he and I made this kind of like somewhat subconscious deal of like, I would be this kind of high stakes investment vehicle. Um, and the family was gonna pour all these resources into me in the hopes that it would like pay off someday. Um, so, yeah, as I've spoken about on Twitter around the time that I was 10, I was learning about um, exponentials and I'd kind of understood this concept of compound interest, rule, learned the rule of 70. Um, and I was also just an inquisitive, nosy kind of kid. So I was like digging around my parents' financials um, without their knowing and um, came across the credit card statements. And it was things like, you know, $75,000 of credit card debt at 25% interest. And in my little brain, I was like, okay, 72 divided by 25. So you're like doubling your debt every three years, like um, on my mom's single line of business, teaching people piano, like we're never gonna like pay this off. Um, in fact, we're probably gonna be extremely tight on money, if, like, because we're just paying so much in interest every year. And that was the case when I was growing up. Um, so I felt a lot of pressure to perform. Um, my dad had me start taking like practice SAT tests um, when I was really when I was nine, I think, because uh, by the time I took the SAT for real, the first time when I was 10, uh, I felt very practiced in it. Um, and I got an 800 at that time and on the SAT math and my scores basically qualified me for like a whole bevy of different scholarship programs, which I'm very grateful for, um, because, um, all of those things kind of paid for a lot of my subsequent education during middle and high school. Um, and I had quite a customized intensive education, uh, because in a way, my dad made my education his full-time job and he like really micromanaged me a lot. So I was intensely accelerated in math. Um, so there was like a program at the University of Minnesota called the University of Minnesota Talented Youth Math Program. And I was the second youngest student enrolled in that. Um, went through the five years of that program. By the time I finished when I was a sophomore in high school, um, I'd finished 
like multivariable calculus and differential equations. Um, and I was enrolled in Stanford University's education program for gifted youth and all of these things. It was, um, felt like I had very little life outside of this like intense academic achievement that was happening. Um, and there was like a part of me that was really trying to rebel. And there was a part of me that like, felt like, oh, uh, like I have such a strong obligation to my family to like do these things. Um, so one of the few escapes I found was like uh, computer games because um, for all of my work at the online high school, um, I really did need to have access to a computer. So um, computer games were like this thing I was able to kind of sneak into my life. Um, <laughs> So the buildup of all of this is that um, I create this life story where the meaning of my life is to get into Stanford University or a similarly prestigious university. I really, I wanted to go to either Stanford or MIT and um, I would study some kind of uh, quantitative field and get like a high earning job and then like kind of like fulfill the destiny that my family has set out for me. Um, and especially with Stanford, I thought like, oh, I've got to have a really good shot at Stanford because I go to their high school. I mean, some of their professors are my high school teachers. That's just insane. Um, <laughs> but during uh, junior year, I really mess up. Um, junior year, I was under a lot of stress because um, I was enrolled full-time in Minnesota's post-secondary enrollment options program at the University of Minnesota. So I was taking a full university credit load in addition to some online high school classes. And I was also living by myself on campus. Um, and I just really was like falling apart that year. Um, I felt like without um, the context of like my family around me, I felt super isolated and um, that was like, one of the most difficult academic course loads I'd ever had. Um, and I ended up plagiarizing an essay for a philosophy of science class that I was a part of in the high school. Um, and uh, I was caught and uh, the Dean spoke to me and all of these things. And I think I basically torched my Stanford chances at that moment. Um, And subsequently, I didn't really um, get into any of the universities that I wanted to. Um, in retrospect, I think there's like a certain profile of like an Asian math person that I fell into that was like not the metagame at the time in terms of what college admissions officers were looking for. Um, <laughs> so I don't like totally blame myself there, but uh, it was very painful for me. Uh, I had so many friends who were going to Stanford and MIT, and I just felt like I was being left behind. The one school I did get into that I could afford to go to was the University of Minnesota, um, where I got a full ride scholarship. And I really should have been delighted and like made the most of that because upon entering school, I had 168 credits and technically 120 were required to graduate. Um, but it was like, I've been going to the school since I was like 10 or 11. It really felt like, oh, I like haven't left home. I've kind of like failed in some sense. Um, so freshman year, I was very depressed. Um, and <laughs> part of my depression the year leading up to um, my freshman year enrollment is that I like really procrastinated on my housing applications. And I ended up in this uh, dorm that was in the St. Paul cam campus instead of the Minneapolis campus. Um, so very far away from all of my classes. And it was kind of the dorm that everyone who procrastinated ended up in. So I end up in this uh, dorm room with all these like stoners and kind of like, like uh, low ambition people. Um, and made some very good friends there and started smoking pot and kind of being like, oh, wow, there's this whole like uh, world to explore just inside of my own mind. And, um, so that was exciting, um, but I also hadn't really like 
dealt with all of the um, storytelling baggage that I had. So I was like simultaneously uh, exploring the wonders of marijuana while um, still having this like big depression with me and not being like that functional. Um, so um, the six of us that are like living in this dorm together uh, in this little suite, uh, we repeatedly get caught for different marijuana infractions, some of which are like um, very over the top. Like we made can of butter in our dorm room and it definitely stank up the entire hallway for like a week. Uh, highly egregious. <laughs> um, so we get kicked out of the dorms and we move into this house that we find together that we um, very quickly dub High Tower, And it just becomes like this scene of debauchery where every morning we wake and bake and um, just like high all the time. Um, but fortunately, like, and man, I was really destructing my life. I, at the time I was addicted to pornography. I was like uh, drinking, I was smoking both cigarettes and marijuana. Um, I was like also engaged in addictive habits with like League of Legends and various computer games. Um, and just like every way I could think of, I was like trying to distract myself from the reality of my existence and like um, self-destruct in a way. Um, but fortunately, through all of this polydrug experimentation, I like happened to take LSD and um, I didn't have a good mindset. I didn't have a good setting. And still the LSD experience that I had just like completely broke open my mind and made me realize how much of this like constructive narrative I was living in and how much that was hurting me. Um, and it also like deeply reconnected me to my body where I realized that one of the things that I kept trying to get away from when I would like reach towards distraction was this uncomfortable feeling in my body that I hated and I really like didn't want to feel and when I actually felt into it I realized that it was my own heartbeat and I'd become so alienated from my own body that like I was sensing the thing that gave me life as like fundamentally miserable and like uh unbearable um so the combination of those two insights really like flipped the switch for me. Um, and I became very interested in what had happened to me. Um, so I was reading all of the people like Timothy Leary and Robert Anton Wilson and um, kind of like the great psychedelic pioneers. Um, and they kept talking about meditation over and over. Like, you know, you can't avoid Ted Alpert becoming Ram Dass and these kinds of stories. So I also began investigating meditation. Um, and I feel very fortunate that um, psychedelics kind of like med meditation. And then it just started creating this like compounding upward spiral of like um, improving mental health. Um, and I discovered this wonderful book, Path Notes of an American Ninja Master, um, that has some of my favorite meditation techniques ever, um, and kind of became a guidebook for the next 10 years of my life. Um, and so in 2012, um, a confluence of things happened. Uh, I got into this internship program in New York City um, through a connection I had made um, 10 years previously in Ireland. Um, so that, that was like a karmic seed paying off like way after. Um, and also my parents, um, during a crazy trip I had where my friend gave me something that we thought was LSD, but was not LSD, probably 25 CI and BOEM. Um, I did all these crazy things on campus, campus police, like uh, picked me up and like brought me home. Uh, my parents were really concerned. They end up institutionalizing me for a weekend. Um, and after I get out of there, I'm like very upset with my parents at how they felt like they could just take my autonomy away like that and all of these things. So I basically decided I was going to go to New York and I wasn't going to look back. I was going to try to like go there and um, stay there. Um, so I like had this plan to drop out of school basically. Um, so I get this internship program in New York. Um, it's 
a really awesome experience. I'm meeting all these like high agency people that are also in this program. And um, it turns out I'm pretty great at programming once I get to a professional context, like people are, are impressed. I started out as an intern on the QA team. And then by the end of the summer, I convinced the engineering team to give me a full-time offer. So I was like, yeah, I'll take it. Like, <laughs> I don't want to go back. Um, so I kind of began my life in New York. <laughs> Um, and New York just like brought blessing after blessing. Um, I came back to volunteer for the program that changed my life, Hack and Why, um, as a mentor the next year. And I met my wife through that program. And through a series of job hops, I end up at Google. Um, and that gives me this huge sense of relief because as a dropout, I was like, maybe I'm like missing a certain credential or something. But then once I was able to get the job at Google, I was like, I think I can just leave my schooling off my resume and like everything will be fine from here. Um, <laughs> and I ended up leaving Google pretty shortly after because I, that environment just did not really suit me. Um, I found that I really loved like high paced uh, startup life. Um, and, oh man. Yeah, well, there are like tough times interspersed with this too. Um, like when I first met my wife. Um, so her father had died when she was 12. Um, and her family basically became illegal immigrants uh, with his death because um, her mom at the time didn't have the English skills to kind of like pick up immigration applications and things like this. Um, and um, my partner Daria, she basically went into this survival mode where she never really had time to grieve her father. Um, she just immediately started working to support her family. Um, she graduated high school as valedictorian while she was working at like Brugger's Bagels in her like part spare time, um, this whole time. Um, gets this full ride scholarship to Columbia, like really an incredible person with this amazing story. Uh, um, the first year that we're together, um, she asked to move in with me and, uh, and the space that we had together, it was like the first time that she felt safe to kind of like feel her grief and process her grief. And um, she ends up taking a year off from school for mental health. And um, I find that I'm basically supporting this um, borderline suicidal, extremely depressed person that I like really love. Um, it was very difficult for me. Um, at the time, I was like hiding everything that was happening from everyone around me um, because of my own stigmas around mental health. I was kind of feeling like, oh, like I don't want people to like think poorly of my partner. Like I'm not going to like kind of like harm her reputation by telling people what's going on. Um, so I'm just trying to pretend that everything is like all fine and good. Um, and on some level, I'm feeling very like emotionally coerced. Like I'm almost like trapped in this relationship because I don't know what would happen if I weren't there. Um, and I think that's when I first started like learning about polyamory because I was noticing that like I was forming these um, attractions to people that I worked with that. Uh, to me at the time felt very scary and like unsafe to engage in because um, I still had so much um, programming from the way I grew up uh, from my Christian background of like, oh, like I can't even like think these things about people like that's leading to temptation. Um, so I actually left my first job because I had developed uh, these like feelings towards a coworker of mine that I felt like, um, weren't safe for me to have. And I needed to like remove myself from that environment to avoid it. Um, but it kept happening that I would develop feelings of love for people. Um, and interestingly, it was during a astrology reading where this astrologer was like, oh, you have these like placements, like have you ever like studied polyamory? And I was like, wait, like what? There's like a, a word for thing that I'm experiencing um so that became like a big arc of my um mid-20s just like 
uh, my relationship with Daria and us kind of like growing into being poly together. Um, yeah, I met this amazing friend and we had this very, very deep connection. Um, and for a while, I felt like I was going to be able to craft this relationship um, with the three of us. And it was like everything that um, my heart had ever like wanted I was feeling so happy but then um my friend's partner kind of like became uncomfortable with that the dynamic because he was long distance um and, and I think he very reasonably asked that we kind of like create a bit of separation for a time um but to me that was just in that moment it was so devastating um and um my heart was just completely um crushed uh, and that kicked off like uh, a whole series of explorations about like why I kept finding myself attracted to like either mentally ill women or uh, emotionally unavailable women or women who were like in some way taken. Um, like all, all of these things were like patterns for me. Um, started working with a therapist and uh, started doing, well, had a ayahuasca ceremony where like a lot of um dimensions of my childhood kind of like uh came up to the surface and um I like, saw these dynamics clearly for the first time of like um this protective relationship that I had with my mom and um the ways that she was because of how much she was working she wasn't really like a part of my life in the way that I might have wanted her to be um and yeah, really because of um, this one relationship that kicked off this years long healing journey for me, um, where I've now um, done ayahuasca 11 times um, and just had a series of these like revelations about these childhood dynamics with my father and with my mom. Um, yeah, and I think that you know, after I came back from Peru, um, I jumped into running my own startup for a while. Um, and I finally felt like I kind of like healed enough to take this really courageous step that I had. Um, through the process of doing the startup, I realized there was still a lot I needed to figure out about like self-coercion and like my motivations for um, why I was doing things. Um, and there were like, like a lot of inner alignment issues. So I ended up uh, getting back into crypto because my friend like invited me into this very fortuitous group. And through crypto Twitter, uh, I ended up stumbling upon Visa and like discovering Teapot and just feeling like, oh my God, all my people are here. Like <laughs> I'm like missing these kinds of connections for so long. Um, like people talking about like the sorts of things that I've been experiencing um, it was all really wonderful. Um, and I think I grew a lot just from being exposed to people, like being out there doing things, um, fundraising, like launching projects. So when the Ukraine war began, um, I was one of three people who co-founded Ukraine DAO and uh, collectively we raised uh, like four and a 4.6 million dollars or so that was all sent to Ukrainian um, aid organizations to buy bulletproof vests and uh, medical supplies for people. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably like a good place to stop for now. <laughs> uh, just to name, I, I notice I'm very tired and it's very warm in the room that I'm in, but I am not in the slightest mm. board and I would like to keep talking. So I just <laughs> okay, yawned okay. and you're like, oh, we should, <laughs> I'm not bored. So. Okay, okay. Is there anything else that you'd like um, to add? Well, I realized that um, I kind of left out the ninjutsu practice and all this, mm -hmm. uh, which is something I started when I got to New York um, and has been kind of like a mainstay of my life for the past 12 years. Um, but yeah, we can get more into that separately. I feel like it's a whole topic on its own. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's many many topics <laughs> <They're holes Yes. laughs> let's see um 
Yeah, I think the one I want to start with is you mentioned this in passing in an exchange we had a while ago. And, you know, you said mm -hmm. you, you, you started your life story by talking about your parents and their background. Mm -hmm. And um, let me just pull up what you said here. Um, yeah, I asked you, like you had shared about this relationship to money and your mm -hmm. family story. And I asked, like, how do you think about that in relation to karma or trauma? And you yeah. said... I'm quoting you now. Yeah, I feel responsible for resolving as much ancestral wounding as I can in this lifetime. Uh, I've done limited practice with Dr. Daniel Four's ancestral lineage healing modality. I dream that future generations of my family will consider our heritage a blessing, um, which is so lovely. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah, I just want to ask you about that. Like, mm, I'm not sure anyone has started a podcast episode on this show with talking about their family's history. Like maybe they have, I can't remember. It's been mm. more than a hundred, but <laughs> one is not coming to mind. Mm. <laughs> uh, and what is the question? Like, yeah, why why do you feel that you're responsible for ancestral wounding? What, that seems um, like mm. healing that, I mean, and mm. that seems both self-evident when you say it and, mm. um, why do you think that? I, I, not many people say that, even though when you say it, I'm like, yeah, that seems good. <laughs> so tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I do think on some level, it's a part of our karma to do that work. Um, I kind of feel that the more deeply you can reach in the past and heal things, it kind of like um, mirror images into the future um, and also mirrors into your own present lived experience of your own life story. Um, like, I think so much of trauma healing work is kind of like being able to weave this cohesive narrative um, and like reaching further and further back, understanding causes and conditions and like um, kind of reaching this point where, you know, as a younger adult, I had a lot of anger against my parents because I just felt like I didn't understand the decisions they were making and like, how did they let things get so fucked up? And like, um, but I mean, I think Buddhism has probably influenced me a lot here. It's just kind of like the more deeply I understand the history, um, which is not to say that history is ever truly knowable, but it's like I have a lot of compassion for people now because I just kind of understand like why they did what they did and like where they were coming from um, and that like everyone was kind of like trying their best in the flawed ways that they could with the limited tools and knowledge they had and like you know the fundamental ignorance that we all have and um I think that to me that's like an important story to pass on to my own children it's just like you know we come from a lineage of people who have all been trying their best in some way and um the gift of our life is from the sacrifice of all all of these millions and millions of ancestors like carrying this life force through time um and it's like such a privilege to exist in this moment um and that may come with some wounding but it's like there's gotta be ways in which you can kind of like see how those wounds are also your superpowers and like part of the gift that we're bringing to the world mm. beautiful can you tell me anything about that particular practice that you mentioned? Mm, yeah, the ancestral healing practice. Um, I would call it like a form of um, imaginal journeying work um, in some sense. I mean, my experience of it has not been that deep. I've only done a single workshop and read the book, but not devoted a lot of um, solo practice time to it. Um, the idea is basically that you kind of like cast your mind um, back through your various lineal paths. Um, and you kind of like feel along your ancestral lines, like um, where the energy is kind of strong and good and where it might be like patchy and rough. Um, and you call upon your well and shining ancestors. These are basically like, no matter how far back they go, it's like people in your line um, that, 
really live their lives well um, and are kind of like these paragons or examples to your entire lineage. And you kind of call for their help to kind of like bring healing throughout your lineage. Um, and it's kind of this idea that like um, as the vessel of a lineage, you can in this imaginal realm kind of like go back through the different uh, traumas that your lineage has experienced and kind of like um, work on them through this process. Beautiful, beautiful. And as I said, I love that thought of uh, your descendants really appreciating that they're connected to you. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I feel that for them hearing you say that both <laughs> now and uh, when you said it at the time. So, um, mm hmm. Mm. Yes. I want to ask you something that people have been asking me a lot recently, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure they've asked you even more, which is, what's the deal with this character, you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was really high on acid one day, and I really enjoy reading on psychedelics. Uh, I think that the text just takes on this wonderfully weird quality and... Um, you know, mundane phrases will just kind of hit you different. Or like uh, one time I was browsing Wikipedia and I like hallucinated all this text while I was reading about uh, Erwin Schrodinger, like that uh, only he could have given us Schrodinger's equations and it was like his unique piece of the human puzzle and every person has like a puzzle piece and we need to draw that out. Uh, and the next day I was like searching all over Wikipedia for this text and I was like, I swear to God, there was this like cosmic relevation, rele uh, revelation on wikipedia but i can't find it now um <laughs> so yeah i was on acid one day and i was reading and i came up on this word that was just so weird i just i was just like flabbergasted by it i was like yo 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 you like yo you <laughs> what is this weird word and then it hit me like we already have a letter for this like it's just the letter u um and yeah i kind of like channeled this whole spoken word poem about like why oh you do you spell you why oh you uh and like you and i if we're they're both one letter and both capitalized they kind of like equalizes the linguistic importance of those two words in my mind like a lowercase three letter word to me is not the same kind of like weight and bearing as like a single letter letter capitalized word it's just it's insane to me that our language like lets people get away with this kind of thinking. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. What has it been like for you to practice uh, writing you that way? Hmm. You know, at first I thought it would be really tough because I thought a lot of people would ask me about it and um, I would get a lot of like crazy comments. And um, But it turns out it seems like most pe people just they don't really think that hard about like what they're reading or or they don't want to like cause a scene. So um, I've actually somewhat been disappointed in a lot of ways that like the lack of reaction I've gotten. Um, but for myself, energetically, it just feels way cleaner to communicate that way. Um, so it's mostly these days a practice that I do because it feels good to me to do. Um, and then occasionally I get this like huge burst of joy because someone like you has kind of like taking it on um and that just makes me feel so happy but <laughs> I was telling someone about it last night and um yeah maybe it'd be worth putting this on the record since we're having this conversation mm. about all this of like <laughs> um when we started becoming friends you and I, I asked you about this I was like what's the deal with the you and you're like you explained yeah. it and um I was like, you know what, that makes sense. And of course, I think the first thing that I did like this was adopting the word friend uh, in maybe 2013. Mm -hmm. And I call people friend and that's become increasingly a valuable practice for me. Like it's gotten better and better over the years. <laughs> and, um, and then there are other like language shifts that I've made where it's in different ways I use different words or um, stop using certain words or things like that. And that's like a valuable meta practice for me with one T um, to be careful <laughs> about how I speak and how I write. And there's intention behind the words that I use. And 
that has served mm -hmm. me well uh, in communication and also as a spiritual practice and like an ethical practice. And so I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and then we tried it out and I tried it out in our DMs for a while, a few months. And then at the beginning of this year, I had this tweet about like PSA to the universe. I am willing to change dramatically if it benefits me and those I love all beings. And I, I remember as soon as I wrote that, I was like, oh, I need to take Zen up on this. And like, it's time. It's been time. <laughs> uh, and he's just right about this. <clears throat> and just one second. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it feels better in my body. And knowing what like a decade of practicing the word friend has been like, mm -hmm. it feels like a chance to cultivate the state of mind that you are as important as I am. And like, it feels like I'm very mm. early in that, but I'm like, oh, this is going to be very powerful if I practice mm. this for a long time. And I've seen how these kinds of changes, which may seem insignificant or weird or like unconventional, it's like, you can really go places with that. Um, like, I don't know, I literally people walk down the street and see people as my friend. And it's like, that's <laughs> been a positive change for me. Um, and if I have yeah. a hard time saying the word friend to someone it's like well there's something there for me to look at or feel through or mm -hmm. do and um it also increasingly feels like a protection spell like because all <laughs> relationships yeah. should be a friend like friendly to begin and um i won't get into that but i'm like oh you yes you let's go <laughs> um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so thank you for bringing that into my life and uh i look forward to seeing where that goes yeah, and thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Let's see. I want to ask about a similar question, which is you have a underrated website on the internet. Uh, <laughs> you've been maintaining your wiki for quite some time, and I would love to ask about how that came about and what your experience writing and maintaining it has been like. Yeah, um, so I think the oldest content on that site dates back to 2011, um, which is right around the time I had that kind of psychedelic revelation um that's when i kind of came up with the monikers and cephalon and started you know trying to like meditate my brain um yeah at first i was using vim wiki uh which is a wonderful plugin for vim that turns it into like a wiki editor and uh i rapidly as a programmer was like oh i want something that's custom fitted to me that works the way i want um that uses markdown um so I think in terms of like major software versions, the stuff that's running on my website now is like the fourth major iteration. Um, there are like pieces of code that have been kind of with me for the 11 plus years now, um, 12 plus years now. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's... Um, the way my website works is it's kind of an iceberg because um, there are different like privacy levels within my wiki and there's kind of this top level public view and then there's all of this like massive linkages and uh, information kind of in the back end of the site. Um, <laughs> so one thing I'm excited about as I make like more kind of like visibly online friends like you is to start maintaining more like public facing websites about my friend, uh, mm -hmm. pages about my friends. Um, and I'm personally very excited by this idea of having like a open source intelligence network of our Twitter friends, um, which I think uh, ties in with the directory idea that you have um, or like LinkedIn for Teapot. Uh, I feel like those are both kind of poor descriptions of um, the beautiful vision you laid out, but like, I want it to be far more accessible for people to know like what each other's superpowers are and like how people all relate to each other. Um, like the various friend group clusters within Twitter, I feel like are very important to have awareness of. It's like, oh, like how do you like connect to different nodes? And also if there's like kind of disjoint networks, probably a lot of value to be had if you just go and like connect people up together. So it's important to know like when there are disconnects in the network also. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are there any pages you're especially proud of? 
I think um, my letters to myself page has a lot of my best writing because of framing it as to myself. I'm just much more direct and yeah, like unfiltered. Um, I think in a lot of ways, those essays are for other people, but they are also written primarily for myself and like a Marcus Aurelian kind of spirit. Hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Can you say more about this monikers and cephalon and what it means to you? Yeah, um, I was just finding, trying to find words I could combine with Zen and encephalon means brain in Latin and it has a cool Chinese character. So I like, like this logo I have of like adding Z to uh, now, which is like the Chinese word for brain. Um, there are ways in which I think it's not the perfect username for me because I did spring out of a time when I was very overly identified with like being a mind and a brain and still quite disembodied. Um, so in that sense, it doesn't kind of reflect the full knowledge of who I am now, uh, which is like a much more embodied being, but I still like the name. <laughs> I like it as well, friend, <laughs> especially even more now knowing so much about your life story. Uh mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a question about that I can feel in my body that I will feel until I word it. <laughs> uh, you shared a lot about your childhood and your parental dynamics and this sort of like destiny that your family assigned you and how much that involved the intellect and like you grinding to like get good <laughs> and uh, pay off the debt and uh, I wonder, well, okay, this is a two-part question. First, I found it so fascinating that you both noticed and were able to name so clearly what the like semi-conscious, unconscious contracts that were in your family, like between your parents and between you and yourself, you and your parents. And um, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could name those about my family. And I'm like, yeah. I'm trying to, in the background, I'm like, oh, huh, what is, hmm, hmm. And uh, want to look at that for myself. But I wonder how you think about those contracts and agreements and like deals and how one, one such as myself or someone listening might start to notice them. Mm. Yeah, and I should um, clarify, I kind of linear not linearized the narrative in a lot of ways but um most of that understanding of my childhood is not something i had until two or three years ago when mm -hmm. i was um doing ayahuasca ceremonies and it was really a lot of ayahuasca relevations that kind of like um shifted my perspective and kind of like clicked these things into place um i think all of these things were largely unconscious to me um as i was going through them um so I don't know if there is uh, probably effective therapy methods will also get people to see these unconscious contracts. Um, just for my own journey, it's happened to be through these medicines. Um, but yeah, I wish I had like more concrete advice to give on like how one could actually like root out these kind of unconscious contracts. But um, I feel like a lot in a lot of ways, I've looked into that understanding. <laughs> Take ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> and he's joking you do you whoever is watching uh, only if it's legal in the jurisdiction you're in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um incidentally he just there just to stay on record was referring to <laughs> this person not uh, uh he, he this person's encephalon is responsible for his own speech acts um <laughs> he has been finding that's pointing to tashin has been finding speaking in the third person useful on occasion so um anyway especially because this is an ethical domain it feels worth being clear about which pronoun is signifying what <laughs> yes. um, um let's see so the second part of that question is like how do you relate to that specific deal now which was like be intelligent and then you're my son be intelligent and then you can pay off the family debt and then you'll be a good son you know something like that like how do you, and in particular, how do you relate to your intelligence now? I'm like, yeah, and I guess I'll name subjectively, like, oh gosh, this is vulnerable. But, you know, we're, it, to me, I experience us as in the early days of a very, very beautiful friendship. And 
I'm like, oh, I guess this'll this'll bleed into the ninja thing, but like you've been higher your power levels then. Like <laughs> like I don't know. I it's not like I thought you were unintelligent or something. I'm like, no, this guy is very, very together, but like, damn, like the things you described, <laughs> like intelligence off the charts. So how do you relate to that now? How do you view your own intelligence even? Yeah, that's mm. the question. Yeah, I think that uh, I've become much less attached to it. And it's really been healthy for me because I think there were a lot of ways in which um, my identity was very fixed on this concept. And it's like, um, there was this question in my mind of like, could I ever even quit being a software engineer? Because uh, not being a software engineer, like being a software engineer comes with the connotations of intelligence. And if I'm not able to like, be unintelligent and like would that mean I would just like reject lots of career paths um because they don't like fit that mold um I also think that um my childhood experience has shown me a lot about intelligence and I think that a lot of the science is just really wrong about intelligence I think that I was brought up in a really specific way and that kind of allowed me to like be a genius in certain ways and I think that's available to way more children like every child basically I think every child is born a genius um I specifically remember my dad in preparation to have me take IQ tests like checked out all the IQ test manual books from various academic libraries and basically like coached me on a lot of the IQ test material um so that kind of proves to me that like IQ tests are coachable and therefore they're not innate. Um, so if we wanted to raise the average IQ, we could just be like teaching kids IQ tests. <laughs> um, that just seems really obvious to me. <laughs> I love that description in that I'm like, oh, that's, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, reporting my experience I'm like oh of course I wouldn't notice like especially that you're intelligent because you're not attached to that concept so you're not like projecting mm. it as you're going around the world you're not like oh I need you subconsciously like I need you mm. to know that I'm intelligent because you're not attached to it and then I'm like mm. you know I of course when I check I'm like oh yeah definitely intelligent but mm. it's not like something that like I guess yeah all the time there must be these like semi-conscious um non-verbal like performances happening where it's like let mm. me tell you about my role i am the intelligent software engineer let mm. me make sure you know that so that i keep mm. providing my function is my identity and then you can just kind of also not do that and mm. um it's it's sort of snuck up on me so mm. um, <laughs> yeah which brings us to ninja uh how did uh, you come across that book what was it like reading it and what has your journey exploring that modality been like yeah, uh, I think somebody provided a link to it on Reddit, uh, on some meditation subreddit, or maybe it was a, a cult subreddit. Um, and I just, yeah, I think I resonated super hard with this book. Um, I mean, Glenn Morris, uh, he writes pretty autobiographically in this book. And he just kind of has like a cool rock and roll life um, where he does all this cool stuff as a ninja but he's also holding down like uh normal jobs like being a corporate management consultant and like uh raising kids and um he just kind of described a life where it's like if you become effective enough there's no reason why you can't do it all like you can have a cool hobby and you can have a great family and you can like succeed in the world and you can kind of accomplish all of these spiritual feats and I was like wow I haven't really encountered perspectives like this um he was really into like strategy and qigong and um kind of like using meditation yes to get enlightened but also to just like increase your power level and like be effective in the world and I thought that was such a cool combination of things uh, <laughs> and how did you start training it what was that like for you um yeah so in minnesota i didn't see any like good opportunities to train in jitsu so i kind of kept it as something i would look for uh when i got to new york and my first apartment in new york was by washington square park and there happened to be 
training group that trained in Washington Square Park. So I was like, okay, sweet. Definitely going to check that out. Um, I think I got colossally lucky because um, the quality of instruction within the art like really varies immensely. And I just happened to find um, probably the best, definitely the best group in uh, New York, probably the best group in North America to train with. Um, just like a really high level of uh, training and teaching. And um, I've kind of like fell into exactly the lineage that I want to be in, in terms of like who is in the lineage, like who my teacher's teachers are. Um, so that to me, just colossal good luck. I can't explain it. Um, definitely <laughs> very blessed. And definitely <laughs> unrelated to previous karmic deeds from previous <laughs> lives. <laughs> There's definitely not reincarnation at all. <laughs> it definitely doesn't explain a ridiculous amount of the things in our lives. Definitely not. <laughs> uh, huh. So what does training ninjutsu look like? Mm. Yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, when I'm at home by myself, um, it's like sensing really deeply in the body to try to like um, understand my new details of like, body and alignment and um like the way i'm holding things the way i like form a fist um the timing with which i do things um and then when i'm practicing at class uh our classes are very small it's usually like two to four people and our teacher uh and we're paired up and we're trying to do techniques on each other um and we train with various weaponry um so there's a lot of like unarmed techniques a lot of arm techniques um it's a very collaborative learning environment because it's kind of like um you know with each person you're paired with you're kind of like learning again like how the technique applies to their body um and um the kind of like kohai senpai relationship is really beautiful i think it's just this expectation that everyone in the dojo is there to like teach each other and we're all going to like learn from each other. Um, and yeah, it's really awesome. And then a part of my training too, is I go to a lot of uh, weekend seminars um, with my teacher's teacher. And those are usually like eight hours per day, Saturday, Sunday, um, usually a Friday class too. That's like shorter um, and maybe like 30 people. Um, and yeah, just the whole weekend of training. <laughs> what does it look like for you, Sensephalon, to be approaching, aiming towards excellence as a ninja? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's been quite a multidisciplinary effort. Um, you know, trying to achieve some mastery with my body has involved like learning parkour and Ale Alexander technique and um, trying out lots of different um, training modalities um, in terms of like mobility and stretching and uh, postural restoration. Um, I think that the meditation practice has been a big part of all of these things too. I think there's a way in which um, just the bare act of sitting Zazen, um, literally just sitting, like there are ways in which your body is using that in order to kind of like reform itself. Um, and I think that's one really underrated benefit of meditation actually is that um, I think some of the traditions that are like extremely picky about posture um, get some criticism and it's probably deserved because it's not necessarily what people need in the beginning. But I think uh, if you incorporate all of those details into your practice, you can kind of like simultaneously be working on your mind body system from both the mind angle and the body system together. And there's this very like, beneficial mutual convergence that happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where is it going for you like mm -hmm. if you were continuing to practice ninjutsu for 10 another 10 years mm -hmm. where would you hope that that would lead you yeah um I certainly would want to be someone through which the transmission can continue um so no, I think I have this attitude of like, I hope that I'm not someone who needs who like needs to transmit because other people will also be taking care of the transmission. But if it were to fall on my shoulders, I certainly want to be prepared to be um, a channel of transmission. 
So, and I definitely think that it seems like for every master, there's a point in their practice where um, part of their progression is to start teaching because there's something about the teaching process that also teaches you. I think most people who've taught anything have experienced um, how you truly start to understand something as you try to explain it again through somebody else's eyes. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think, whether it's for ninjutsu or anything else, what do you think makes someone an excellent teacher or an excellent student? Mm. I think one mark of an excellent teacher is that they're very excited to have you meet their teacher. Um, like there's this desire for you to become their own peer and to kind of like be able to get the transmission directly from the source. Uh, however, like high up the sources, it's kind of like, oh, like I recognize the ways in which I'm like a source of loss in transmission. Just this is just purely information theoretic. It's just anytime there's a communication linkage, some amount of information is lost through the linkage. So like a truly great teacher like wants to be out of the way as soon as possible. <laughs> that made me think about Peace Pilgrim and how mm. delighted I am when people read Peace Pilgrim. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And of course, there's many other teachers that I've had uh, or who I look up to or respect. Of course, I've never met Peace Pilgrim, but... Uh, she has been a teacher to me through her words and yeah God, and gosh i wish i could have met her like actually mm, yeah um, i would you know I, they maybe this is arrogance but i wish she could meet me <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah but um i think we would enjoy each other's company um oh for sure mm, mm. I feel like I still don't really understand what a ninja is to you, what that means to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so just to break down like the vocab for a moment, uh, the word nin uh, means to like endure or persevere. It's the Chinese ideogram is there's like a big knife over a heart. Um, and it's kind of like, how do you behave? Like, how do you act when your heart is on the line? Um, and to me, that's, this concept of like, can you like summon up the courage in like a very dire situation to still do what you believe is right? Um, and uh, I think there's like mental and physical preparation for that. Um, I always like hope to God that I'll never use any of the skills that I've acquired, but um, it's like if I'm called to use them, then I hope that I have the courage to like step into that situation. Um, you know, historically, ninja were mostly intelligence gatherers. Um, there's a stereotype that ninjas were assassins. And while it's true that there are, like, assassinations in recorded history that were conducted by ninja, um, it was much more of a strategic thing of, like, let's discover the information that can prevent the war rather than, like, even having to get to the point of needing to kill someone in order to pre prevent conflict. Um, so a big thing that ninja would do is just kind of like integrate themselves into a certain social scene and collect information and like understand what's of strategic importance and like distribute that information and kind of like have a big network. So I think in a lot of ways, like every member of Teapot is some kind of ninja intelligence node in this like global project. <laughs> I was thinking about that while you talked about it and what's the question? It's like, yeah, how are you approaching that as um, someone who's on the internet, connected to a lot of different people, learning about a lot of different things that are happening. How are you relating to that? Mm. Yeah, um, I think that my my wiki is like a part of my practice. Um, I try to take note of like relationships between people, people's interests, people's needs, people's wants. Um, I'm I'm trying personally, but I'm not the best at it, I think. I think there are people out there where this is really their gift um, to, like, understand how I can create surplus value by, like, routing the right people to each other, um, recognizing that, like, 
oh, this person has this ambition and they like need this skill. And like my friend seems like they'd be aligned and they have that skill. Like, let me try to make that connection. Um, various things like that. Hmm. Hmm. I see you doing that and I see you growing into that. And <laughs> it makes me very excited. I feel like hmm. uh, we have good things in our future. So. <laughs> hmm. Sure that. Hmm. Um, let's see. And we talked just now about ninjutsu, and I want to ask also about Buddhism and mm -hmm. what your relationship to Buddhism has been. Mm. Yeah, um, the last year was a very intense, intense Buddhist year for me. Um, I managed to do, um, what was it? 23 days of retreat, um, which I was very pleased by. Um, it's also my first year doing retreat at all. I'd just been like solo meditating for a long time. Um, you know, I'm very deeply influenced by American pragmatic Dharma. Um, and we kind of talked about this a bit, how there's like this Protestant strain in like American Buddhists, I think. Um, so uh, I think we love concepts like sola scriptura and um, kind of like stripping things down to like uh, what we consider essential. Uh, <laughs> um but yeah, that that's just speaking for myself in a lot of ways. Um, you know, like I personally find things like the Bodhisattva vow extremely inspiring um, from like a finite and infinite games perspective. It's like um, to will the liberation of all beings is one of the largest possible games that I can imagine. Um, so there's a way in which I feel like anyone who takes the Bodhisattva vow is almost definitionally playing an infinite game. Um, so that's very exciting and inspiring for me. Um, I think that it's one of these things that I don't feel super qualified to talk about a lot because I don't think I've necessarily like gotten, you know, like done the thing yet. Um, <laughs> so I've been pretty circumspect about trying to share like only things that I've like really, really verified and confirmed within the context of my own life that it's like beneficial to me. Um, but uh, there's definitely a day in which I hope to be able to share the like full fruit of the path. And um, that would be really wonderful. Hmm. <laughs> what has been fruitful in your own life so far from the Buddhist teachings? Um certainly um loving kindness you know i think that the way i formulated it was in like my i love you motto um where i spell love as l-u-v and that's like a shorthand for loving kindness for me um and that was actually one of the first things i had to deeply engage with is just um walking around and trying to send the intention of like loving kindness to people and saying to myself i love you and that's how i like start my emails um yeah i think that one attitude shift just like dramatically changes quality of life because so much of our life is interacting with people and being with people um i would say more recently with poly stuff it's like mudita is so huge because um i think that poly like really works well if there's mudita um mm. and in the absence of mudita i think that it's it's just difficult. It's like more logistic difficulty, uh, more scheduling difficulty, um, more interrelational difficulty. But if you have mudita, then everything is like this runaway, like chain reaction of like, uh, you like reach a certain escape velocity. <laughs> Compelling. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I think, you know, from my martial arts training, um, being able to kind of like see into impermanence has been very helpful because I've been at times subjected to just like enormous amounts of pain, um, like, you know, getting hit in certain ways or like, um, it's possible for people to hit me in a way where the strike like vibrates deep into my bone and it's like my entire like bone will be like deeply throbbing. Um, and in moments like that, to be able to like tap into the impermanence and kind of like uh, zoom into how 
pain is this like signal that's like um, constantly arising and passing and there's a lot of space within it um, has been immensely beneficial to me just in terms of like not suffering. <laughs> <laughs> What has it looked like for Polly with Mudita to hit like sort of an escape velocity and just be better and better for you? Mm. Yeah, I mean, so far those conditions have been uh, very scarce and precious. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I have like had these brief like heavenly times of being in these three person dynamics where like each person is kind of like able to really enjoy the dynamic that the other two people have and like take a lot of joy from that. And, um, and it's like a pair of people like seeing that, um, like get their own joy from it. And it just, it just kind of like cycles and cycles. And, mm. um, yeah, it's really lovely. Mm. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm reminded of, uh, a thread I showed you a couple of weeks ago where uh, I forget how I put it at the time, but something like, yeah, I think like Polly is a vehicle for exploring this, uh, which was about mm -hmm. Mudita. It was like, mm -hmm. and there's a whole bunch of adjectives before Mudita. It was like cinematic Mudita, imaginal Mudita, <laughs> like this Mudita, that Mudita. I mean, that, that story mm -hmm. is a whole, that thread is a whole story in itself, but um, I'll link to that as well. Cause I'm like, hmm, <laughs> uh, I think I forget about this sometimes. Um, so it's, an interesting breadcrumb for me to explore mm -hmm. as the love pilgrim. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it kind of makes sense that the love pilgrim would be interested in Polly, at least, if not actively. <laughs> uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Let's see. Okay, I want to come back to money. You talked about mm -hmm. how you, you did resolve your family's debt, yes? Yes. Um, congratulations. You fulfilled thank you, thank you. <laughs> not your, not our destiny, like one important quest, but not the sole <laughs> quest. Uh, cause it's like, clearly you're still going. So good job. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, how did that feel actually? Mm. Yeah. Um, it felt quite exciting and relieving in the moment. And then immediately afterwards, I was kind of at a loss of what to do with my life. Um, because I think exactly like you're saying, it's not, the like sole thing but I was kind of living my life as if it was um so in the absence of like still having to do that there was this gaping hole of like oh well then like what is my life about and like uh where do I derive meaning um and like I went to Burning Man to try to find out these things it's like I realized that um I'm not that motivated by like sensual experience I guess um personally um yeah it's like <laughs> kind of left me in an existential void and um a lot has sprung out of that I think it's good to just be able to like sit in those kind of like periods of not knowing hmm. I'm not sure which of these questions to ask first I can see <laughs> them either way so yeah given that you experience this existential unknowing and this frame of, oh, you thought this was the quest and you realized it was just a quest on the quest. Like, what is the quest now? How do you conceive of uh, the purpose of your life now? What is the larger frame that held resolving your family's debt but was not limited to it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I have at least two insanely ambitious quests, but I actually am not necessarily sure, like, how I would fit a frame around, like, the quest mm -hmm. of, like, taking care of my family's debts and these other two things. Um, I mean, I guess there's maybe a thing of, like, uh, extending the envelope of my care, um, but still kind of, like, keeping some kind of like familial familial ancestral connection as kind of like a center from which that care emanates and then um also somewhat of a fulfilling um obligation to like um ancestors of the past but uh in this case like ancestors of practice um so these two like really big goals are um one is i want to see um 
the declaration of an international recognition of a sovereign independent Republic of Taiwan um, with like minimal bloodshed. Um, and two is I want to bring uh, ninjutsu to Mars and kind of like see it become a multi-planetary practice and lineage. <laughs> Very good. Uh, I'll be <laughs> needing to ask you about both of these things. Yes. <laughs> Let me go up the stack and mm -hmm. make sure I ask this question. And I'd like to invite you to speak the answer to this question, not only to me, but to your descendants in your life. Mm. Mm. Uh, you are the being that resolved a specific strand of karma in your lineage related to money, mm -hmm. uh, at least in this life and for the time being. There's always more to explore, but... <laughs> You know, you really went and did something, um, mm. which makes you, in my eyes at least, an authority on this question. Mm. Um, what would you tell me and your descendants about money? What is right view with respect to money? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's so important for everyone, any especially spiritual people, to understand that um, wealth is not created from finite resources in fact wealth is like this infinite thing that we create through our like mind and spiritual power um like you think about the amount of wealth created by the iphone and that is not primarily made up of the constituent matter of like what we've taken out of the earth to make those phones there is this like combination of heaven and earth that has come together into the form of an iphone that's created this immense wealth um so I think a lot of the Buddhist teachings in terms of like um, monks kind of like giving up a lot of material things in a way that's just to show that like, hey, we have something that's very valuable and creates a lot of wealth for us that is just in our mind and for them to kind of be a, an exemplar of that. But I don't think there's any reason why a spiritual person can't kind of like create a lot of material and spiritual wealth together because I kind of see them as fundamentally inseparable and you can see this in like people who are rich who have a lot of like financial and material resources who are I would not consider wealthy because there's this kind of like spiritual impoverishment and um the lack of that kind of like inner resource makes it so that no matter how much they have they like really are not wealthy um so I think that's something to say is that um, the most dangerous meme about wealth is to see it as a zero sum game. I can feel further questions about this. So let me just mm -hmm. feel them and they'll come out. Mm -hmm. I'll ask for myself first. So this, I mean, this may be hopefully useful to your descendants as well. <laughs> I imagine that they're listening to this recording. So uh, um, bless them. Um, but this one's for me and I hope it will also be useful to them. But uh, I imagine that you don't mind me revealing that you support me on Patreon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder... <laughs> why you do like how do you see mm. it from your perspective to support someone like me or you know i imagine you're very generous in other ways as well like how mm. do you see generosity both in the particular case of me and also other people mm. yeah i mean partly it's like i've received a lot of value from your writing and i can easily imagine how millions of people one day could be receiving that kind of value from your writing um so um, it feels like a very easy kind of like calculus of leveraged generosity that I could support you and that um, what feels like a relatively small monthly contribution for me could then scale the impact like so many people in the world. Um, and yeah, so you're like a creator that I really want to support because I think that that impact will be amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I think that the generosity with which you're like, sharing these things and the quality that you're putting into your writing it's just it's really worthy 
Hmm. Not everyone sees things this way. Mm. That's a question. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think there's a lot of ways in which um, traditional economic theories have kind of limited our thinking and I think it's understandable because traditionally economics was kind of rooted in scarcity. Um, and I think of much of what um, humans do to each other that is kind of like ignorant or unskillful stems from the fact that our ancestral environment was very like scarce. Um, and there probably was a lot of competition over resources and um you could create something like a wheel that would have like immense surplus value, but it's like the times that people invent things like that, it's very few and far in between. Um, so the dominant conception of what wealth was is like rooted in like material accumulation. So how do you um, help, how to put it? Part of the reason I asked this question at the end mm -hmm. of the period <laughs> <laughs> is like, how would you help someone to see things the way you see them? Hmm. I think that deeply reflecting and meditating on the internet can be a great thing. Um, I think that's probably the way that I found my way into this perspective is just to think that like, um, if you look at the constituent parts of the internet, like a lot of undersea cable and wires and wireless transmitters and all this stuff, it's like all of that material doesn't really add up to much value. Um, but it's all the people on YouTube, like creating educational tutorials for each other and people on Twitter, like tweeting out their insights and um, this massive web of like mind and togetherness that generates all the value. Um, I think that like directly points at the immaterial wealth that is being created. Hmm. Zooming out for me in particular, what makes mm -hmm. you excited to support someone mm -hmm. or a project or anything really? Hmm. Um, a lot of times it's enough for someone to ask. Um, that's that <laughs> I just heard the sound of that blowing someone's mind. <laughs> There's someone who's like, what? I can just ask? Mm -hmm. Like, really? Mm -hmm. Really? Like, I can, it's almost as if I can hear it right now. I'm like, yeah, that just blew someone's mind. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways in which I'm like not very open to help. And I've noticed in my life that it's actually like a gift for the giver to also like um, know that they can help someone and that it'll be like really received because there have been lots of people in my life where it's like, I wish I could help them, but um, I sense energetically and I know from our interactions that they really like aren't available or like open to being helped. Um, so for someone that asked for help in a way that's kind of like, oh, like how wonderful, like that I can actually help you, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I do know, well yeah. said. Hmm. Um, let's see, what is this question? This one is coming back to me in particular. Um, Yeah, we, we have this conversation at a particular time, where, as you know, I'm trying to get to $3,000 a month on my Patreon by May 1st. Um, I had been planning to have that, maybe like hoping vaguely to have that happen by the end of 2025 or 2026 mm -hmm. or something. It was like, yeah, that'll happen when it happens, which is fine. I think that was good, but it became clear, like, no, it's good to go for this. And um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering... Yeah, I, I loved how you described wealth and how there are people who are like, you know, maybe on paper wealthy, who have access to lots of material resources, but maybe aren't wealthy in this mm -hmm. like more meaningful sense. And mm -hmm. I consider myself very wealthy in the more meaningful mm -hmm. sense. Like, I don't know, I think I'm the richest guy I know, like from that perspective. Um, yeah. Like I live a blessed life. <laughs> um, Hell yeah. <laughs> and um, functionally, uh, I will say I practically have less access to material resources than mm -hmm. I might be able to make use of in good ways, which is mostly sure. what I would like to do with my yeah. resources. It's like, I'm not interested in, uh, like a mansion or 
sports cars <laughs> or something. Like, I, don't know, I would drive a sports car once, but like, I wouldn't want to own one, you know? Uh, so um, I wonder what you think about that kind of a situation where someone, yeah, let's ask it from both ways. What advice would you give someone like myself who is abundant with respect to their quality of life, but not material resources and vice versa, someone who has access to lots of material resources, but doesn't have an abundance of, you know, meaning, satisfaction, fulfillment, that sort of thing. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, personally for you, I think it would be well within your rights to create bundles of your content that are, um, that you receive money for. Um, hmm. Like I think about Visa and how, for the sincere seeker who lacks resources, everything that he's ever written is available for free. Um, and but if you want it in a particular form, which he's curated to be like maximally convenient for your ingestion in the form of one of his books, like there is the opportunity to pay him for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a super fair trade. And I also think perversely, there's this thing where a lot of people value information more because they paid for it and they'll like actually put it into use and like actually value it if they pay for it. Um, so there's almost an opportunity for you to just increase the value of your offerings by like, <laughs> like charging money for them. <laughs> um, and it's so weird and perverse, but it's like, I, I trust that you will always find ways to like um, release everything that you have for free. But I think that like, there are probably a lot of people who would be psyched to be like, yeah, like I can just give Tashin money and I'll like get value from it. <laughs> mm. My thoughts are running in multiple different directions. Let's see. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll start with what's most alive, which is that I recently, I've heard many people say what you said, that sometimes mm. people will value something more if they pay for it. And I think mm -hmm. that within the conditions of our current economic situation, and more importantly, our cultural situation, that makes a lot of sense, where that's mm -hmm. like, uh, almost, um, I don't have a good word or phrase for this, probably there's someone with a PhD somewhere who has a good phrase for this, <laughs> but like, like an adaptive behavior in a specific environment such that it's so common that people take it as an axiom or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized recently, so in the empowerment work with Mary mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Anansi and Steph in the empowerment department of the service guild, um, one of the projects that I have currently is building infrastructure around this thing that I've built called the quest map. And I'm like mm -hmm. basically creating like training programs. It's almost like an online course for people in that community to um, move through the quest map. And I realized yeah. there's still stuff for me to learn and iterate on here, but uh, what is the learning? It's like in that context where there's a well-knit community of people, like a scene, it's really, it's more like a scene probably technically, mm -hmm. but a scene of mm -hmm. people who are like know each other and trust each other and are like peers you don't need to charge them for them to want to do it because mm -hmm. there's community. But if you're in an atomized individualistic society where there's no like community that, um, or like people around you that are necessarily like incentivized to do the same things that you are, then paying yep. for it kind of is like, uh, <laughs> like a, a really a weak proxy for that. It's like or a replacement where it's like, Oh, I guess I'll have to do it if I pay for it. And it's almost like coercive or something. It's like, if I pay for it, then I will coerce myself to do it because I'll feel bad that I spent money. And it's like, ooh, that's a whole ick thing for me. And <laughs> um, this, on the other hand, this thing where it's like, oh, being with peers who we all just want to do the thing. I mean, I need to, mm -hmm. I full admission, I need to do a better job of creating this infrastructure to support people and mm -hmm. like, um, stuff like that. There's still stuff for me to learn that I can like hear my future self being like, oh, you're totally missing this dude. But um, <laughs> uh, anyway, I think that's an, been an important insight for me where like in an individualistic society, um, transactive payments make sense, but it's not, and it's like the de facto norm in our culture, but that yep. if you swap to, I don't think we're actually like a collectivist thing, but where there is, no people like a network of people that are well connected um mm -hmm. it isn't as necessary actually as far as i can tell 
yeah, I could definitely see that because I think people do use paying money as a commitment commitment mechanism um, for them to kind of be like, okay, I've committed to doing this. Um, but I think peer support um, has been shown to be like a much more powerful uh, commitment mechanism in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> well, and even like, I mean, setting aside even commitment mechanisms, it's like, mm -hmm. like it creates the conditions whereby the skills are just transmitted. Like mm -hmm. um, people naturally level up together without even trying or efforting or uh, mm. like striving or forcing or anything like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah. When I was working as an educator, I loved project-based learning much more than any other form of learning. And I love that the service skill I feel like is centered and rooted on project-based learning. Oh. Fun service-based project learning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fun service project-based learning. Anyway, yes. Um <laughs> I wonder what you, you've recently been reading Peace Pilgrim, and you may not have read this part, but she has a very strong view, which I'm curious what you think of, mm. which is um, anyone who shares spiritual teachings and charges for them does themselves mm. spiritual injury, uh, mm. which is a very strong claim and one that echoes mm. in my mind and doesn't mm. sit well with many people. I'm wondering what you think about mm. it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if on some level that's true and that the spiritual teachers who are able to do this um, are able to kind of like regenerate from taking that damage. <laughs> ah, juicy. <laughs> wow, the nuance is strong in this one. <laughs> wow, I like this take. Because huh. the easy take would be like, she's right or she's wrong. Uh, mm. I've heard a lot of people tell me she's wrong. And I'm like, hmm. Mm, mm. <laughs> really though um <laughs> in our in our logical reasoning environment argument from authority is considered a fallacy but mm -hmm. to me if someone says like peace pilgrim says something it's worth really taking seriously and yeah. looking very closely at not that you have to say it's true just because they said it but like I'm not sure I want to take on the damage if I'm wrong mm -hmm. from that, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I'm taking damage in other ways that I'm like, hmm, I may be okay with this. But in this respect, I'm like, hmm, I don't know if I want to mm -hmm. take that damage. So I charge for mm -hmm. things that are, um, you know, clearly to me, not spiritual teachings. Um, I charge for things if, like, it's an event that otherwise couldn't be put on mm -hmm. uh, without it. But as much as possible, I try to do things by generosity. And uh, a lot of the things that I do are more or less directly related to spiritual teachings, even if I don't see mm. myself as a teacher, necessarily. It's like, mm. could I could I press you on a point there, though? Please, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, I really wonder how you delineate, like, what is a spiritual teaching versus a not spiritual teaching? Because to me, I think that any teaching of skillfulness is inherently spiritual. And there is no such thing as skillfulness that is not spiritual. So in that case, I would do myself spiritual injury by selling anything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you're saying uh, level up your generosity game, Tashin. <laughs> is that I'm I'm um, sort of being I don't know the adjective, but uh, a little bit obnoxious. <laughs> uh, would, would you agree with that or you are, are you I imagine you're actually saying this of like no you should feel good about charging for things because like what is and isn't a spiritual teaching actually mm, mm. is that more your perspective or I mean I'm hearing that and I'm like mm, more generosity <laughs> sounds good to me bro <laughs> I could see it going either way honestly um yeah. I think that there is a certain generosity for you if you were able to like allow yourself to receive the transactions of all of these people where it's like if they're lost in a world where the only way they're able to kind of like conceptualize things is to transact um is it not an act of generosity to kind of like meet them where they are and that's like a skillful means of reaching those people is to be like yes there is a way in which you can transact with me and like i will adapt myself to your paradigm uh in order to like touch you deeply mm -hmm. um versus having an attitude of like yeah i just i don't want you to um 
create a duality between the mundane and the spiritual, which like would render you less effective in the mundane, which is also the spiritual. Do you see me doing that? Um, well, I think that uh, when people make it hard to like give them money, then um, they're possibly less effective than they could be. Um, Have I made it hard to give people money, me money? Um, you know, I think for certain people, it's much more of a commitment to sign up for like a Patreon than to like do a one-off purchase of like a PDF. Um, people so can purchase people... PDFs for me. Mm, okay, so that that's my own ignorance because uh, mm. I wasn't aware of that option. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I do a lot of things for zero plus pricing. There's at least one thing. There, mm -hmm. My first novel is available for 25 plus, uh, mostly mm -hmm. be for my own cool. emotional protection because it's incredibly vulnerable <laughs> and I wanted to put up a barrier to people reading it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, I love zero plus pricing on Gumroad because I, mm -hmm. it's like, and I do creative commons with everything. So pe even once people get it, they can give it away if they want to. But um, yeah. Well, do you feel like your novel is not a spiritual transmission of some kind? Just, um, I wonder about that. That's interesting. It's, <laughs> and in fact, I think it says my life philosophy better than anything else that I've written. <laughs> so uh, now I'm like blushing basically because uh, let's see. Uh, there's a, basically there's two, a road that I can go down here where to be internally, this is so interesting. Someone, yeah. I can like feel people finding this conversation very interesting ways I can't predict <laughs> but um to me right now subjectively it seems that there's two roads I can go down with that which is either I change the pricing to zero plus today on that ebook <laughs> because it is in fact a spiritual teaching and I don't want to do injury or I update my view about money in relation to spirituality um you know I'm actually like the more I live on generosity like mm -hmm. really as the basis of my life I haven't really figured out how to talk about it in a way that I feel comfortable with or it doesn't offend mm. people or something mm. but like i'm mm. like i want to live even more based on generosity actually mm. yeah um like i prefer it and mm -hmm. um and importantly i will say let me say <laughs> to me living on generosity does not mean merely that my life is supported by the generosity of others it means also that my life, I see my life as a gift that I'm giving through, you know, for example, this, I didn't charge you to be on mm -hmm. this. I'm not charging someone to listen to this. I am giving this right. chunk of time as a gift to you and the world and myself, everyone mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. to like have this connection and see what comes of that. And I see that as generative for everyone involved and connected to it. Yep. And yep. so it's, yes, it does also mean that people can give me money to support that process. But that's almost um, that's a side effect of from the beginning seeing my life as a gift um, mm -hmm. and like second order consequence of it. It's not the purpose is to just get money from people who want to because because before I think I used to think like maybe a decade ago subconsciously the beliefs I had was oh like you're a fool if you give people money because you're being tricked to give away money and people mm. are just going to use it for what they want or I don't even, it was like that was very subconscious but mm. I don't see it that way at all now I'm like oh the very first thing is my time and energy and my life is itself a gift and oh. I want to give as much as I can and mm -hmm. from there if people want to support that process yeah they can do that because they see that but it's mm. like I'm good so anyway maybe I'm leaning towards changing it to zero plus pricing today it's like so more people can okay. read that novel yeah. <laughs> mm. which is a really weird novel and very uncomfortable to read probably <laughs> so, but there's a there's a content warning on it so it's okay, a very okay. funny content warning actually because it uh it's like oh there's violence and sex in this and also even worse run-on sentences <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think about well, all that I'm, friend um no you know i don't want you to feel like i'm actually advocating that you um yeah take your life in a direction where you do charge money for things um i think zero plus pricing is really beautiful um and i think it's important for people to like live lives that are like well outside the mainstream conception that like serve as examples of what's possible mm -hmm. um yeah i just personally i'm always like trying to like 
go after what seem like uh inconsistencies so um oh i love it i was i, I wanted to have this conversation well because my sense is one it's a very interesting topic to me we have very mm -hmm. different backgrounds and experiences mm -hmm. and yeah. then also i don't know i guess my sense is like you are one of many people who can unlock even more abundance in my life mm -hmm. and um in fact that would be good i don't think that money is my bottleneck currently but like uh -huh in the next months or years, it will become the bottleneck of how much good I can do in the world. And mm. it would be good to have thought through and felt through this more clearly uh, so that I could do more good when the time comes. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, Tosh, and there's a lot of people where I wouldn't necessarily think, oh, if this person just had a million dollars a month to allocate, they would like choose wise and good things to do with it. Mm -hmm. You are not one of those people. I would fully entrust you to just like receive a fire hose of money and like redirect that into like good and useful causes mm -hmm. um so in so far as all of like capital networks are like various people routing money in um different ways i think that you personally karmically deserve to be like a much larger node in the routing of money mm -hmm. That's lovely of you to say, friend. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I love that frame as well about routing and really of resources and goodness, goodness in the world, unfolding mm -hmm. value. And um, I've actually, I have some, I'm, I'm increasingly interested in economics. So mm, maybe there'll yeah. be an economics arc at some point, but um, I've, I've taken, I've written a few tweets that are essentially economic takes uh, that I'm, mm. I haven't, in fact, haven't really received very much pushback. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Mm. People read it and they're like, oh. yeah, that seems true. I'm like, mm. oh, nice. I was expecting some pushback. But um, mm. anyway. Um, okay, so let's return to still talking about money. But I want to ask you one last mm -hmm. question about this, which is um, what advice would you give your descendants about money? Hmm. Yeah, um, I think there's like two major ways that I look at money that um, helps me relate to it. Um, one is to think about it from a kind of permacultural water flow management perspective, um, which is that like, um, I mean, there are accumulations of water in landscapes that are very valuable, like lakes and ponds, and they contribute to an ecosystem. Um, so I think they're are ways in which storing money um, can be valuable. Like I think most people who lack um, an emergency savings budget and are living like really paycheck to paycheck and a $500 like car emergency just fucks up their life. Like that's pretty horrible. Uh, I think that most people could deal with having like a well or a pond on their kind of like financial landscape that tides them over. Um, but for the majority of money, I think that money is not meant to pool in one place. It is meant to flow. And it's all about thinking about how am I designing the landscape of my life so that um, when there is kind of like money just ambiently in the environment, like falling from the heavens, basically, that um, some of that runoff is being kind of like collected. Uh, and then I'm also channeling it wisely. So like, I have some control over how the money runs through my landscape and where it kind of exits. And each of those like streams of exit is like something that I have a lot of agency over and like, where do I want to see that money ending up? Um, and I think that's like one perspective to have. Um, and then another thing is to think about money as like a being that you're in a relationship with. And it's like, uh, am I in a, in a really like domineering, like dominating relationship with this being? Because that doesn't feel good. Um, am I like constantly like stretching this being and like really almost abusing it in order to like try to get certain outcomes in my life? Or uh, and also being dominated by it is not great either. You see people who are almost like ruled by their conception of money and almost enslaved by it. Um, but I think the right relationship to have with money is like, it's a friend and an ally and there are certain ways that you live your life where you kind of like feed it and it's healthy and it's helping take care of you. And together you're able to like accomplish this kind of like shared goals that you have. Like, I think there's these positive feedback loops where it's like you and your money team up to go on a quest. Like that quest required certain education, like maybe training and equipment and you complete this quest and 
as a result of the quest, like both you and your money have leveled up because there were like rewards involved in doing the quest. And now you can repeat that process, getting like more powerful equipment and having better skills and you go on a more ambitious quest. And um, like your money is one of your sidekicks and part of your adventuring party that like helps you accomplish things in the world. <laughs> I love that metaphor. And let's make sure to come back to video games uh, mm. provided we have time. But yeah. um, I want to ask you about your two future goals, the one related to Taiwan mm. and the one related to Martian ninjutsu, uh, <laughs> which is a phrase we were under direct command from our brother Anansi <laughs> to use on this recording. It's been done. Uh, can you tell me about those two goals? Yeah. Um, so as far as Taiwan goes, like it's a really vibrant democracy. It's a very beautiful culture. Um, highly recommend anyone who gets the opportunity to like experience Taiwan for a while. It's got this like wonderful blend of like a Japanese influence, the Chinese culture, and um, definitely some American influence too. Um, and to me, it just feels very silly that um, we're in this situation where, to make an analogy with the U.S., it would be as if Texas was still calling itself the Confederate States of America. And we had this weird like situation with Texas where they weren't allowed to like stop being the Confederacy. Um, and we were kind of like holding on to the Civil War situation. Um, and that's the same situation that Taiwan's in. Like Taiwan right now is not allowed by the People's Republic of China to stop being the Republic of China, even though it may very well want to be the Republic of Taiwan. Um, and I think the Taiwanese people have a distinct identity. They have a distinct nationality. Um, and that feels important to me. And then as far as going to Mars goes, um, there's really like many, many different things that I want to bring to Mars. And I want to be early on Mars because um, Mars is kind of like a new cultural pe Petri dish. And I believe that any cultures that you bring on the Mars early on are going to have an outsized impact on like overall Martian culture. And I think that Mars is this opportunity to kind of like rethink how human society could be structured from first principles. Like, you know, it's going to be the first time we invent a government already knowing that we'll have the internet. So like how different is that going to make the way we provide services and the way that we like take input from citizens and do voting and all of these things. Um, it'll be the first time we invent a government already having cryptocurrency. So we can just like entirely skip banking infrastructure and everyone can just have like um, crypt cryptographically secure economic value. Um, and as far as ninjutsu goes, it's the lindiest tradition that I carry that I also think has the lowest probability of being transmitted in my absence. So that's kind of how I think about it being like uniquely a thing that I want to bring to Mars. But I also want to bring like polyamory and Buddhism and all of these other things that I care about. <laughs> First off, I'm appreciating Anansi because he was like, since Eflon will have an answer about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's true you did so that's good uh well seen and uh i hope and pray that you bring whatever is most true and alive and good from the spiritual traditions of this planet mm. uh, whether it's buddhism or taoism or Christianity, which is in your lineage, or mm -hmm. the other beautiful religions and traditions of this planet. Uh, I wonder what will happen as we venture from this planet to other planets mm. on the inside with respect mm. to religion and spirituality. I, In this moment, if I allow myself the treat of <laughs> sensing into it, uh, it really seems like a similar jump might be possible on the inside where there's a yeah a cultural shift whereby the there's a i don't it doesn't really feel like we're wanting to have like a global religion as such but some kind of global mm. harmony from different strains of religion that's not currently mm. present um mm. i'm almost imagining like an epi for religions or something where it's like <laughs> 
yeah, you can be Muslim and I can be a Buddhist or I can be Muslim and you can be Buddhist or something, but then we can agree and uh, connect more deeply and see the ways in which these are actually complementary and not in conflict in a way that, of mm. course, many mystics and practitioners of spirituality have known for a long time, but where that's mm. more obvious and globally distributed or something like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think something that so far seems underrepresented in the sci-fi that I've read is just how everyone going to Mars is going to probably get a dose of the overview effect. And that effect has been huge on every astronaut that we've seen where like we have this whole new appreciation for the Earth and for spirituality and dependent origination, I think. So um, I think that'll be a big impact on the people by the time they arrive on Mars to have all gone through that shared experience of like being outside of the Earth's protection. Um, mm. And it seems like just being in zero G like fundamentally changes people in some way. Um, so I'm very curious to see what kind of falls out of that. Can you say more about both the dependent origination and the zero G parts of what you just said? Yeah. Um, I think that it's hard for us to appreciate the earth while we're on the earth in some way, because um, it's just, it's the ground we stand on. It's like, um, people take it for so, granted. It's so baked into our experience. It's like very hard for us to even imagine. I think in, even in most people's wildest dreams, there's always a sense of gravity. Um, whether you're flying and like bounding through space, like there's still this orientation, there's still down to people. Um, and I think that, you know, even in my wildest psychedelic experiences, I've always been grounded by the earth. Um, so I think to be unanchored for a moment, like that'll be a revelation to people. Um, and it seems to even cause epigenetic changes in people that have experienced uh, zero gravity. So. Like what kinds of changes? Um, I couldn't tell you exactly. Um, mm. This is just like a vague factoid, probably. Mm. <laughs> mm. But there's been research done on astronauts, and it's like they have different gene expression when they return to Earth. Fascinating. Mm. Mm. To me, it seems like it would be good to make two jumps to uh, from nation to globe and also from humans to all life on this planet and really all beings. Yeah, uh, I would hope that, yeah, both the earth and all beings are a part of whatever, um, if there is to be a kind of like religious, spiritual convergence on the planet, not, not necessarily like merging. I don't, I don't think anybody mm. really wants merging, but like harmony, then it would mm. include reverence for the earth and its people, its humans, its plants, its animals the environment mm -hmm. and that it would implicitly include all beings uh i would hope and pray for that yeah i i think it will because um yeah i talk to people sometimes and they're like well maybe humanity deserves to be wiped out and like do we need to fight so hard for a survival all of these things but it's like it's not just about us it's like it's about all of life on earth and we just happen to be the only species that are able to bring other life forms to other planets with us. So in a way, I see that as our karmic obligation um, in the same way that I felt like I had an obligation to my family. Like, I think we have an obligation to all the various life forms on this planet to help kind of ensure their safety and um, that they will get to spread and enjoy the whole fruit of the universe. Um, and I do think that like, as soon as people get to Mars, the first things they're gonna miss are like animals and plants. Like they're just gonna, just gonna want them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you, um, in the parlance of our culture, Mars pill me? Like why would one even think that it's possible to go to Mars like in your lifetime? Like I could mm -hmm. see uh, 
someone being like, yeah, we'll go to Mars in 300 or 600 years or something. But uh, mm -hmm. what makes you think that you might be able to go to Mars in your lifetime? Yeah. So just to clarify this question, this is mostly about feasibility and, mm. and not like why to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. yeah. Well, I imagine, <laughs> yes, there would be someone who would also say why, but I'm, I'm more yeah. interested in the feasibility personally, but it would probably be helpful if you answered both. Yeah. I mean, the why to me is, uh, uh, my wife is a site reliability engineer. So the thinking of mm. like um, making robust systems is very uh, baked into me. It's like, we want planetary redundancy, like God forbid some kind of disaster befalls our planet and the entire earth is wiped out. It's like, wouldn't it be better if like, that doesn't automatically mean that penguins are extinct because we have another planet. Um, I'm glad you speak to <laughs> non-human life, not because we need to be ashamed <laughs> of being humans, but it's not just us, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of the feasibility, yeah, there was this huge bottleneck of like, it's really freaking difficult to build a single rocket that can travel all the way from Earth to Mars because the amount of fuel required to go that long distance is so heavy that it's hard to get out of our atmosphere. Um, SpaceX has figured out a very elegant solution to this problem, which is that you launch two Starship rockets. One has the actual payload that you're trying to get to Mars. The other one is filled only with fuel. And then when they both get into orbit, they actually dock to each other. The one refills the other. And then the one with the payload now has fuel to make it the rest of the way, way to Mars. Um, and then because they've got this reusable rocket system, the one that was sent up to carry fuel just comes back down and they're able to like create the system of like uh, refueling rockets so and getting them to Mars. It's so cool. Um, I think that SpaceX has made significant progress on the Starship program. I don't see any in principle reason why it won't work. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of execution involved and they're working tremendously hard at it. Um, and then another encouraging thing that I think everyone should consider when they think about going to Mars is that I think a lot of people imagine going to Mars will be a one way ticket. Um, but the only way that the economics of going to Mars work is if the rockets are reusable, which means that Starship, SpaceX is explicitly planning for Starships to come back from Mars because they need those ships to like be able to do multiple trips. Um, so once they get to Mars, you're able to manufacture the methyl ox on Mars, that's fine. Um, and the ships are gonna be able to go back. And something you have to consider is that there's no useful industrial output from Mars that we would like bother to send back to Earth. So these rockets will be mostly empty. The entire value of the rocket is just to get the rocket back to Mars or back to the Earth, which means there's lots of empty cargo space, which means if a person wanted to return to Earth, there's no reason why they couldn't. Like the mass of a single human going back, any number of people going back to Earth is really trivial. So there's no reason why you couldn't serve like a tour of duty on Mars. Like maybe you live there for 10 years and then you miss your home and your family and you go back to earth and you like live your life. Um, yeah, it's not, you're not like condemned to live on Mars if you get there. <laughs> <laughs> and you think that because of the work that SpaceX and others are doing and other ambient changes in t culture and technology that it will be feasible to do in your lifetime? Yeah, I think in some sense, there's this window where we kind of really want to, want to do it in our lifetime. Um, I kind of take this view of history that it's not necessarily going to be like a linear progression of progress. And so mm -hmm. anytime we're capable of space flight and we're able to get to Mars, we should really jump through that window and like take that opportunity because it's possible that in the future things will degenerate and we'll kind of like lose that ability again. Mm -hmm. um, so it is kind of critical to me that in the next few decades this happens. Um, I mean, I think that Elon is very closely tracking the kind of like cycle between the Earth and Mars, because there's these periods of time when we're as close to each other as we'll ever be in the sun's orbit. And you think about it, like if you're on opposite sides of the sun, that's really, you're probably not going to be doing any interplanetary travel at those periods. So I think he's looking really hard every single time we have a window where the Earth and Mars are aligned, like, by that time, can we start sending things back and forth? Mm. Fascinating. Can you say more about this view of history that you have that's implicit in 
these, mm. these sort of calculus that you're making about Mars? Yeah, um, this is an especially unique view. I think Samo Berja has a good podcast episode on live players about this kind of like long history view. Um, it's just that if you dig into the archaeological record, you can find lots of um, great empires that are seemingly um, extinct. Um, and it's not completely implausible to me that like maybe in some ancient time humans have reached our present level of civilization and um, collapsed. Uh, and then, you know, if you go real far out into the fringes of thought into like pure conspiracy theory, like there are people who think that Mars maybe looked a lot like Earth one day. And um, the reason Mars looks the way it does now is because there was a global thermonuclear war. And we are, in fact, the refugees from Mars on Earth. Um, and that just kind of underscores the importance of getting back to Mars because it's like, who knows if the Earth will one day be like the Mars-like planet in our solar, solar system. <laughs> is there, what kind of evidence do people cite for that? This idea is totally um, novel to me. I've never heard of it. Oh, yeah. Just kind of like the composition of the Martian atmosphere and that it seems very plausible that at one point there was a healthy atmosphere and lots of surface water. Um, and now there's not. Um, I think there's this... Um, <laughs> big geological formation on Mars that looks like it could have been some kind of um, planetary scale projectile weapon that like grazed the surface of the planet, um, mm. like some kind of massive rail gun. Um, mm. I mean, it's really sci-fi stuff. It's like <laughs> what kind of intergalactic or planetary scale warfare happened, um, you know? Mm. Do you take this theory seriously? No, I hold it pretty lightly. Um, but I think there is this poetic idea in my mind that it's possible humans have been on a number of cycles of like going to Mars and then coming back to Earth and then mm -hmm. going to Mars. And we've just been trapped in this kind of like refugee cycle of like messing up the planet we're on and then like terraforming the planet we're not on and then like messing it up. And... <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I, I hope that's not the case, but um there's definitely a myth, a poetic part of my mind that feels like it's very possible that we've been doing this. Mm. Mm. I have another question I'd like to ask, but I want to speak mm. first to. Mm. Yeah, it really feels like a privilege to have this kind of a conversation, and I learned so much. And uh, what am I trying to say? I can imagine someone having all kinds of reactions to this conversation, <laughs> any aspect of it. And I really want to speak to how I see this right now, which is just really to listen to someone and to witness how they see the world, even if it's very different than us, is such a privilege. Like it's worth mm -hmm. just almost like when I have these conversations, I just table, suspend disbelief. <laughs> where it's like, mm. I just want to know what it's like to be you and how you see the world. And mm. when I really let myself do that, that's one that's beautiful in and of itself. So it's like, wow, it's this is mm. what it's like to be Zencephalon and how he sees things and how it fits together for him. And, and then by necessity, that refactors how I see things. Like mm. you can't totally sandbox things, but there is this move of suspending disbelief and then I can kind of choose, oh, for me, for example, an update, I put a task during this, I'm going to change the pricing to zero plus on my novel. <laughs> it's like, I think it's time. I needed that when I published it to have that barrier, mm. but I would like to live even more by generosity. And mm. I do think it is a spiritual teaching in the the certainty chapter, especially, which is quite short. Um, mm. And we can just, just by entering someone's world, we can see our own world anew and make new choices mm. and new things become possible and we don't have mm. to just become this other person we still have agency over ourselves and the, how we relate to the world and other people but it's it really is a privilege to just spend some time imagining what it's like to be someone else or asking them questions or just be like well what do you think about that and mm. um, like even if, for example even in a world where you were like no i think it's literally true that this terraforming <laughs> thing i'm like well that's interesting 
That's really interesting. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it is literally true. It could be. I, I genuinely don't know. I've never heard of this before. I really don't know much about Mars. I don't know much mm. about our solar system. I don't know much about pretty much anything. And it's like <laughs> setting aside whether it's true or not. I think it's important to like have a mind that is supple and can just mm. receive what it's like to be someone else without necessarily needing to reify it or get fixed mm. on it. And um, this conversation has really, I'm like, I I need to speak to this right now. <laughs> so mm -hmm. thank you for listening to me rant about this. Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts about any of that? Um, I mean, I completely agree. Uh, a big part of what my mind's been processing during this conversation is like, um, well, what if our entire economy ran on generosity and like, what does it take to get there? Um, and that's like, feels so far off from where we are currently. But, you know, I have experienced environments like Burning Man where there was a gift economy and like within that context, it worked. Um, Do you know about offer networks? Yeah, I think you started telling me about it. Um, I tweeted about them recently because I was like, oh, I wonder, mm -hmm. I read about them maybe seven years ago. And I was like, that's cool. And we have AI now, so like, where are the yeah. offer networks? <laughs> yeah. Um, some of my friends inspired by uh, Charles Eisenstein, we were doing like the kind of like gift circles um, where we're, we're each bringing things out, like services we were offering. Um, and that was creating so much surplus value just within like a circle of like eight people. And mm -hmm. yeah, certainly I imagine if you could extend that kind of network over an entire city. Um, or the world. It'd just be or, huge, yeah. Or the solar system, I hear. We're, yeah, we're looking at that scale now. So Yeah, yeah. Because um, I look at things like uh, the Buy Nothing app um, and even just Craigslist. Like, There's lots of value just being created ambiently on Craigslist by people giving things away. Um, mm. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> mm, it really is. I, I, I suspect you and I will talk a lot more about this in the future, mm. which brings me to my last question. <laughs> my uh <-huh>. last question, <laughs> which is an interesting shape of a question. Mm. Um, you and I have been corresponding amongst other things with, well, uh, with Anansi about video games mm -hmm. and yes. what they mean to us and them as a metaphor for, I don't know, work or life. And mm. I want to ask you, what do you understand our shared interest with respect to video games to be? Like what it is, what is it that we're exploring or on about? Mm, mm. Um, I think there's a number of levels of the conversation that we've been having. Um, I think on one level, there's the conversation of people kind of have these like meaning frameworks that they use to navigate their lives. And a lot of people seem to find playing video games um, very like inherently like fun and meaningful. Um, and a number of people I know seem to be not enjoying their lives as much as they could be considering that we are in like the most massively multiplayer, like highly immersive, best graphics, like everything video game. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. So there's kind of a question of like, how do we just help people have more fun in this game that we're already all playing together? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Uh, I think for me, there's also like a level of um, really mystical, occult kind of thinking that I get around video games. If I like really, really try to apply the hermetic doctrine of like as above, so below and make analogies with what we're able to do with present day video games, it gets into some really weird places. Like um, I'm the type of role playing game player where I will do like save file manipulation, like I'll try out different like ways that I could complete a quest and kind of like have multiple parallel save files and I'll kind of like choose the outcome that I like the most and part of me wonders if I don't have some kind of like oversoul that's manipulating the save files of my own life and it's like <laughs> maybe some of these like strange chapters of my life that I don't know how to make sense of it's like why did I do things that way and like on some level it feels like a mistake like maybe it's because my oversoul like has this overarching goal that I'm trying to get to and the only way to get there is through this like weird convoluted path um 
<laughs> so that's like one example of um, mystical video game inspired thought that I think about. I'm going to reserve the right to change my mind and ask you another question, <laughs> <laughs> which is can, oh, uh, MCU is the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Bodhisattva Cinematic Universe. T go. <laughs> yeah, um, Bodhisattva Cinematic Universe is an invitation to everyone and Teapot and anywhere across the world, really, to start like manifesting your headcanon into the real world, because I think a lot of us have probably had this experience of meeting someone and being like, man, somehow in my life, this person is super special. It's like, they're also a main character of my own life story. And they probably have all of these like superpowers and stuff. And like, they might not even know it, even though I know it. And it's just kind of an invitation to enchant the world. And, you know, you could give each other like cool backstories and past lives. And it's like, you know, I can totally see that in some past life, like uh, Hashin did do a lot of time in a temple and um, and that's why he doesn't need to do it in this life. And he's able to like play as the prophet class instead of the monk class. And it's like, <laughs> I could just imagine that stuff um, and it can be part of my headcanon and we can create like a shared headcanon because um, our heads are all really huge and contain each other. So it's just like, fractally holographic um, world of imagination. <laughs> I think everyone can see by this time why I'm so delighted to have made Zencephalon as a friend. My, I feel my little boy inside so excited. He's like, ah, I made a friend that's so cool. You know, <laughs> He's, uh, that's the coolest thing I've heard all day, which, which beats Mars and talking about this terraforming <laughs> theory, which was previously the coolest thing I'd heard all day. So um, anyway, we have talked about many things. Is there anything you'd like to talk more about or ask questions about or dive deeper into? Hmm. Well, I mean, something that I'm super curious about the way you live your life is just um, how you think about romantic connection in this kind of nomadic way. Um, mm. And Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to answer that. And I feel like to really do this justice, I'm going to go to the bathroom first. Okay, so great. <laughs> let's take a bathroom break and uh, be back in a second. Excellent. See you back in a moment. I would like to answer this question. It feels incredibly significant. Mm. And it is important that I answer it well, mm. both accurately and ethically. And mm. I would like your help in doing so. Okay. I loved what you said about like, developing shared head cannons, And I suspect we'll mm. also talk a lot more about that in the future. Yeah. Um, can you say briefly why you're asking me this question and how you see me like such that you would even want to ask me this question? Cause that will help me to answer mm. well. Yeah. I mean, it's a curiosity I have for myself um, because I do travel quite a lot. Um, and I mean, one interesting possible benefit for doing poly for me is that I could have like an extended network of lovers across the world. Um, that's not really how I've been pursuing poly so far. Like I've mostly just tried to have long-term relationships in my own geography. Um, but I think there's a lot of other possibilities out there. Um, so I'm curious about that. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm curious about, yeah, like how you hold the container for a relationship uh, when it's like across time and geography. And um, if it's even important to you to have the concept of like something being long-term um, as you're living your life now, or yeah, all of these things are very interesting to me. Very good. That's helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, gives me a sense from which to stand. Um, well, first off, something I have learned about myself, at least at this point in my life, I, it seems like, I don't know, the play style of this character or something, or mm -hmm. in our metaphor, um, yeah, just my nature so far. And I mean, everything can change dramatically, but every day of my life so far, uh, that's not accurate. What I mean is my disposition is very much one that's like romantic and sexual. I mm -hmm. love, especially women, I love women. Mm -hmm. pretty much always loved women um yeah. 
they bring a lot of joy into my life and those connections <laughs> bring a lot of joy into my life. And yeah. um, I think it's been important for me to acknowledge that and admit that and be like, especially as a, like someone who's doing like spiritual stuff, it's like there are play styles where you're like, just forget about all that and right. more power to the people who do. Mm. They're choosing their own life, but I'm like, that's, that's just not going to happen for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Even the monastery that I trained at, like part of the reason I was willing to train there was that I could still have relationships. Um, mm. uh, you couldn't have relationships with people who were there, but you could mm -hmm. have relationships outside. And in fact, I did while I was there. And oh, cool. um, that was important for me. And um, I also feel like relationship of any length is sacred and mm. yeah, or any kind is sacred and built yeah. on friendship and that you are changed by the people you let into your life and you change mm. them. Mm -hmm. And really, yeah, relationships are like, a, like of all kinds, friendships, conversations like in this are a spiritual practice for me uh, mm -hmm. that I'm demonstrating, for example, through this podcast and through our friendship and other friendships and relationships that I have. Um, but the Buddha told Ananda that friendship is the whole of the spiritual path, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, oh. not just half, which Ananda thought. And mm -hmm. um, I'm also a pilgrim. And at this time where I wander from place to place, that may or may not be so for the rest of my life. I haven't made any like mm -hmm. lifelong commitments, mm -hmm. but I am currently a pilgrim. And I'm also a pilgrim in a global society where I... Mm -hmm. I'm not, it's not a walking pilgrimage. I don't really know how to describe my pilgrimage, but it is a spiritual practice for me. It's a global <laughs> one and it's one that's made possible by air travel. And mm. yeah, I've been in multiple countries and I've had lovers and partners around the world. Um, I've been blessed by the women that have come into my life. Mm. Um, each one of them, I've learned beautiful things that have been such gifts to me. And then I hope also that my life was a net benefit to them. Um, yeah. It hasn't been easy. This play style is hard. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I'm still learning and growing and sometimes it's a mess, you know, like it's hard. Yeah. Um, and I could speak more to that personally in a private conversation, but mm. it's not like I've got this all figured out. That said, given all of that, mm -hmm. one of the things I really love about my pilgrimage is the way in which I get to connect the dots between different people and places and ideas and almost spread things that want to happen, but might not have an easy way. Like, I don't know. I, I in fact, in this conversation, I've thought of different people. I'm like, Oh, you should really connect with this person or mm. talk to this person about this thing. And, you know, maybe they're close in your network, but maybe they're not. And yeah, that's often the case where like, I don't know. One of my friends was living in Oklahoma for a while and it's like, he's a mm. lovely person. And, like, mm. would other people in my network have known about him in Oklahoma? Like, maybe not. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and specific connections should happen that, you know, almost want to happen. And then I can be a vehicle for making that happen. Yeah. And similarly, because relationships are so fundamental to that, romantic relationships are an instance of that where I also go just habitually go very deeply in connection with someone mm. and really see someone's soul and mm. let them see my soul. And um Right now, it seems like there's two futures, and I wouldn't be surprised if it works out differently, very differently than I expect, but these sort of keep oscillating in my mind. And in the past, when I've had things oscillate in my mind like this, I end up finding a third thing that's neither or both or other or whatever. But um, like leaving the monastery, I had that oscillation for like eight months about whether to leave, and then here I am <laughs> doing this thing. <laughs> so... Um, I could see a world in which I had a long-term partner who was like my wife and even was monogamous mm. relationship where we, yeah, I really recently I've been thinking about like power couples, like, mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. like Bodhisattva couple, like service couple yeah. that yeah. I would love that for me. Um, a oh, king yeah. and a queen, you know, like, let's go. Yep. Um, yep. That's a world. Um, another world is one where I keep having, you know, basically short-term relationships with different people or maybe some long-term relationships that and some short-term relationships or something um yeah. but I, I don't have like uh uh like a nesting domestic partner or something or uh, i also have thought about having a pilgrimist as it were with me that would be lovely. <laughs> like another pilgrim who was a woman that i was in a relationship with 
Um, that would be lovely and difficult, mm -hmm. um, practically, logistically. Sure. Um, but I imagine life, I'll change and the world will change and life will surprise me. So yep. I do think that, what is it? This particular play style and this particular class, there are really interesting benefits for the whole world from someone being a pilgrim or someone mm. being a messenger uh, that I'm still learning how to talk about and even how to do. But mm. the more I step into those roles and those using those skills, the more benefit I see for everyone I'm connected to. And mm. uh, this will be sort of load bearing for how much benefit I can do with my life. And I look forward to seeing how that shakes out. Yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, you used the words both lover and partner, and I'm curious how you distinguish those or are there different like things that come with those roles in your life? Um, mm. I have an old tweet from 2021 that says, um, friends are the best. Uh, <laughs> lovers are just friends you can kiss and fuck. Uh, <laughs> And partners are lovers you hope to love for the rest of your life. Mm. Um, yeah, I think I still, I know I was being playful and, you know, I swore in it and stuff, but um, mm -hmm. I stand by that. I think that's true. Mm. And it's important that um, it, this is increasingly important to me that every kind of relationship be built on friendship. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you don't have a good friendship, then it doesn't make sense to connect romantically or sexually. And it doesn't make sense to collaborate on a project. Like yeah. I, this is a rule for me with my collaborators, actually, where it's like, if it becomes hard to collaborate, I will end the collaboration so that we can stay friends if need be. Yeah. Like, my friendship is more important to me than any project we're doing. Even if it's very important, I'd rather maintain yeah. a friendship. And that's part of why I have such good collaborators uh, mm. is like, there's really strong one-to-one -one relationships that I've built mm. and I'm good at that. And you know, we'll see how that plays out. It's life is complex and changes and hard, but yep. um, I do my best with that. And yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think like the time variable is one, the commitment variable is one, like mm -hmm. almost also, yeah. Like resonance, how much is wanting mm -hmm. to be like, I think of myself sometimes as like a catalyst or even like spreading seeds and mm -hmm. uh, which is a, you know, a playful, unfortunate metaphor sort of, or fortunate, <laughs> but, um, but like, it's for me, I really experience a connection like that as catalyzing where I change and they change in the same way that I think you and I are both being changed by this conversation. If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. I'm being changed. Yeah. I can see that from the inside and I hope you are yeah. as well. Uh, yeah. and it's like, if you really connect deeply with someone in any context, that's going to have a, a mutual effect and, um, yeah, so it, I think it's just about like length of time and like the commitment and almost how much mm. wants to be exchanged or is beneficial to exchange and um, even something about variety and breadth mm. where it's like it's good to connect to a lot of different people actually because mm. things are exchanged and even that's like that that's healthy for the global environment or something like if mm. I really go out <laughs> on a limb like it's healthy to have people who are connected to a lot of different people in mm. most ways and I know it's hard for our society to talk about this. I feel embarrassed talking mm. about it, but it really mm. seems this way to me. So mm. anyway, I'm blushing now, uh, at least on the inside, <laughs> if not on the outside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot that it's like difficult sometimes to talk about the poly experience. I often feel abashed where it's like, like I almost don't want to talk about it because I feel that it will come off as like bragging or something, but it's mm. like... um. I, there's probably something to dig into there um, of just showing people what's possible. Um, but yeah, I've, I've often felt more judged for like having a poly perspective than like any other perspective that I hold in my entire life. Uh, <laughs> Relatable. I have, I have yeah. experienced poly discrimination it, from people that really hurt to receive that mm -hmm. from. And mm -hmm. um, it's also, it's also tricky. There's almost like an, yeah, an information theoretic, part of it where like I take great care to respect the privacy of people in my life and mm -hmm. I have not said a lot of things on in public that I yeah. might or something or like who yeah. I'm connected with or how or how it went down and what was beautiful right. about it or what wasn't and it's like that's a private matter and it's hard to like show the kinds of things that I'm talking about without being 
public. So I, I walk that line as best I can, um, reporting yeah. my own experience and feelings, hopefully in a way that's not too revealing in uncomfortable ways for specific people or something like that. Um, even just yeah. out of principle, you know, where they're in, in practice, a lot of people don't seem to mind too much, but yeah. 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 I resonate so hard with a lot of that because I kind of have this idea in my head that like a gentleman doesn't kiss and tell. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in a culture where there is a lot of slut shaming still, it's kind of like, it feels like a very private matter to like um, be discreet about like, who our lovers are um and that has some unfortunate side effects sometimes because it's like um i'd love to live in a world where i can kind of broadcast to people like yeah like i'm just gonna let you all know that like she is a really fantastic lover and like mm, you should totally. get to know her <laughs> uh, the women i have known they are lovely um yeah. in many ways that i love to sing when it's appropriate their praises when it's appropriate um <laughs> Yeah, I actually put in the love vision for the love department of the service guild that it was poly friendly. Like it's not mm -hmm. that people have to be poly, but I think mm -hmm. it's important to me that we not discriminate. And especially because I think like finding new ways of romantic connection is important for the love mm -hmm. work. And yeah, um, that was important for me to add to that vision. Mm. Um, this conversation also reminds me that I would feel so excited for you to meet my friend Steve Bean, um, mm. who um, really like taught me so much about Polly, and um, he is also a highly underrated online writer. Um, mm. He uh, has a fantastic blog post uh, titled The Friendship First Approach to Dating, which has been foundational to my own life. Uh, I want to read felt that. Very, like... Yeah, resonant when you were describing like your approach to relationship. Um, completely agree with that. For me, it's felt very important that like anyone that I uh, stop having a lover relationship with, I still remain friends with. And, mm, um, yes, me too. Yeah. Mm. I want to say one last thing about this, which is like... Mm -hmm. Certainly on this issue and probably on others, there are going to be people who like maybe are uncomfortable listening to this or disagree mm. or don't like mm. it. And I'm like, you know what? That's valid. This These things are complicated. <laughs> They're messy. And I, I'll be the first to admit I've made mistakes or I would go back and do things differently. Like I want to like say, get, hit me with the save file, God. Like where's the save file? Let's go back, <laughs> and, you know, like redo. Um, yeah. But um, um, I think that from the perspective of I don't know. The, yeah, just the play style that I've approached for my life. It's important to be brave and to try mm -hmm. things and be willing to make mistakes or to have effects that you would do differently afterwards because um, I still don't know how to talk about this, but I value something like living my biggest life and yeah. like having, yeah, really benefiting as many people as possible and having the most joyful experience I can as possible. And if you have that play style, then you will have effects that you wished you'd hadn't, and you will make mm -hmm. choices that you in the future might do differently. But I have valued that kind of boldness. And I just want to reflect both that I am aware that this is difficult and not easy, mm -hmm. and that I'm probably making obvious mistakes and <laughs> it's been hard and I apologize to anyone I've harmed. And also mm -hmm. it's like, I value that boldness from within and trying new mm. things and the world needs us to try new things and mm. the ways that we've done things are not necessarily working and know, experimentation is good. So everyone has to find their own balance of these things. Um, and I think there's a value in a more cautious play style as well, but mm. um, I want to sort of reveal <laughs> some of the values underneath the choices that I've made. Yeah. Well, amen to that. <laughs> Beautiful. Anything else you'd like to talk about? I think that's a lovely note to end on. That I agree. Feels really good to me. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Zencephalon. It's been a pleasure to talk with you today. And I think, yeah, I really feel like this is a friendship is a blessing in my life. And I hope also for our friends in the world. Mm. <laughs>